Patterson and Michael Remus. What is going on, everybody? Welcome to a Victory Monday edition of Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Got the white towel, the white shades they gave out at the game last night, and I'm still catching my breath from that insane 7-6 win by the Winnipeg Jets over the Colorado Avalanche to start off the Stanley Cup playoffs here in the peg. We've got uh, a lot to talk about today as the uh, series is now officially underway with the Jets getting that big win. Home teams dominating game one of the Stanley Cup playoffs so far tonight. More action tonight, including the beginning of the Oilers series against the LA Kings and the Vegas Golden Knights and the Dallas Stars. Jason Damaris, former NHL defenseman, is going to jump on the program a little later on with us. Should be a lot of fun talk about what happened here in Winnipeg and everything else around the playoffs. And we'll also welcome in the hammer, Jeff Hamilton, to really focus in on last night's win and uh, moving forward into game two tomorrow night at Canada Life Center. I am going to take the glasses off because unfortunately, now being blind in my old age, I need my glasses to uh, to operate but I figured it would only be appropriate. This was a nice touch that they added on all of the uh, all the seats last night, along with the new, here it is. This is the new Winnipeg whiteout towel. And uh, I got to tell you, Winnipeg and Manitoba, uh, you put on your best yesterday. Um, tons of feedback and accolades from around the sports world on just how nutty it looked like in Canada Life Center. And having been lucky enough to be there in the stands alongside many of you, I will absolutely agree. It was uh, a very memorable night and uh, nice to get a win in the whiteout because that had not happened since 2018. Um, listen, there's so much to get to. We're going to kind of dive into it. We've got a ton of clips from uh, post game from yesterday uh, before Hammer uh, gets in. Um, listen, just before I bring Michael Remus in, uh, Huge shout out to the sponsors that make this show happen each and every day. And a special welcome to our newest sponsor. Great to have the gang at Rollies Transfer on board with us. I think I saw Ryan from Rollies in the chat as well. Uh, we'll let you know a little bit more about uh, their great services a little later on. But great to have Rollies with us as well as... The awesome people at Princess Auto, Cool Bet Canada, Consolidated Supply, Wallace and Wallace, Manitoba Battery, Modern Man Barbershop, Canadian Club, Little Brown Jug, F Apparel, Aikens Lake Wilderness Lodge, Boston Pizza, Royal Sports, and we will get to a why not question of the day for not Auto Corp at Waverly and McGillivray, as well as our golf report for our friends at Breezy Bend Country Club. Michael Remus. How are you doing today after that? Shout out to everybody in chat. Great to see you guys. And hey, there's Ryan and Rollies. Great to have you guys. Uh, great to have you guys on board and on board with us. And uh, Remo, everyone was on board last night. Um, it was, I mean, just an absolutely perfect day. The pre-gaming downtown. I was in the plaza, the Hargrave Market Plaza. Just a phenomenal. That is what that building and that public space was built for. Um, on an absolutely glorious day, and then things got better. And, well, I mean, listen, if you like white-knuckle rides, that you got one last night between the Jets and the Avalanche. But uh, bottom line was they got the win, but everything else that went around that game was uh, a perfect sports day here in the peg. Yeah, incredible weather. <laughs> uh, the Jets got their first win in front of fans since 2018, like you mentioned. Um, you know, you had the atmosphere inside, the street party, uh, the flyover, the, as you mentioned, the party at the plaza. Everyone was buzzing, and I showed up a little bit late. I was worried about hitting traffic or lines to get in, but there were zero lines, Hus. Everyone was in uh, for warm-up, 
for the pregame show, the production in the arena, how they have the, I love the the live and the whiteout camera. They've got yeah. snow on all of their like score screens and everything. It was so uh, well done. And uh, I did a, the post game, you know, reaction video with Connor that's on our channel. I joked, it was like Winnipeg Jets Halloween. Everyone coming out in costumes, uh, dressed in all white, trying to one up each other. Um, it's an incredible atmosphere and got a ton of national recognition. The game was on ESPN2 in the U.S. Pat McAfee is Winnipeg's biggest fan now. I he has no idea where we are, no. but he wants to come here he wants and be a part of the whiteout. I think that, that was a sentiment, I think, from a ton of people around the sports world that in that, you know, I saw writers from uh, other NHL markets um, just say how unique of an atmosphere and uh, and how all in everyone seemed to be. And, you know, I saw a quote from Marat um, speaking with one of the players. I'm going to pull this up because I think I retweeted it yesterday. Um, speaking with one of the players before the game. And, uh, yeah, he said, a longtime Winnipeg Jet to me when asked what playing in front of the whiteout crowd means to him personally. And he said, if I could swear, I would. Go on, swear if you really want. It feels pretty effing amazing. They're in the fight with us. And that is what it felt like in the building last night. I mean, there were a lot of ups and downs from that game. But I think... In a, in a, in a, some ways, even though this was such a different game than the way the Winnipeg Jets have won so far this year, they were the best defensive team in the National Hockey League that did not include a lot of 7-6 nights. Um, but much like, you know, the nerves of the fan base earlier on this season, when are things going to be going to go into the tubes? Uh, you know, it, 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 I would not have faulted Jet fans if they sort of felt like bad things were coming just because of the scar tissue of, you know, the losses in the whiteout over the last few years. But there's a quiet confidence about this club that they will come back and find a way to get the job done. And they did that a number of times last night. And maybe most importantly, getting into the head early and often of Alexander Gorgiev, who had an absolutely miserable night um, you know, when it was in the Colorado end, it was feeling a little bit like last Saturday, Remus, where the Jets put up seven. They did it again tonight, but this time the Avalanche were going punch for punch and toe to toe with Winnipeg offensively, putting up six of their own. It was incredible, and uh, Nakusha kind of took the you know the air out of the building, scoring first six minutes in with a beautiful wrister over Hellebuck's shoulder. It got kind of quiet. I mean, they were out shooting the Jets. Pretty significantly, and it was eleven to one. Yeah, it was eleven to one in the first six minutes, and uh, listen, we knew that the Avalanche felt that they were a much better team than they'd showed against Winnipeg so far this season. And I think the Jets and Rick Bonus had to be ready for a big push. Um, listen, that was a, a play, sort of a you know a cross seam pass to I believe it was Velarde that went off quickly, turned around by Nishushkin, and just an absolutely perfect shot. But, you know, the Jets needed to be ready to weather a storm from Colorado. That one went in. And, man, when Josh Morrissey scored um, shortly thereafter to tie it up at one, that was one of those moments, I think, that reinstalled, re, you know, boosted the confidence of fans in the building um, after a start that wasn't particularly great. The first period overall was so bananas. I mean, we were talking about that one goal and then Josh tying it up. By the time we got to the intermission and met up with friends anyone that had anyone had bet the under had already ripped up their tickets and we were talking about three four three against and an even slate after one of the craziest 20 minutes of hockey i can remember at the building in a long time yeah i, I mean game one i think the feeling coming into the playoffs this year different than previous years you know 2019 you kind of had that bad second half last year you're scrambling to get in but this year they had the big winning streak coming to the playoffs. You're finishing second in the conference. I think you're feeling pretty good, even if it's the Colorado Avalanche. So, yeah, Josh Morrissey, I mean, throws a soft shot. That was like 60-something miles an hour they showed on the screen. I loved Nemestikov just winding up for the biggest slapper uh, <laughs> off the turnover up the middle, Huss. I mean, just an incredible shot to put it over Georgiev's shoulder. You know, you had a couple, you know, bar breakout passes that you miss that end up in the back of your net. And, yeah, it's 3-3. Three, three, uh, Mark Shifley uh, goes in front and Velarde finds him. That top line was buzzing. Josh Morrissey also 
very good. And like you, after that first period, like I don't know, you needed a drink or something after. It was it was wild. And oh, I can I, tell you, mm -hmm. I can tell you, <laughs> many people had that drink at the game last night. It was. Uh, Let's just say that I think sales were brisk uh, both before the game and during. And just back to that Nemetsnikov goal. Um, I, I'd been saying all year, just wait till the playoffs. Alex Iafalo is going to be a difference maker. I know Kenny last night on KNR said that was his best game as a Winnipeg Jet. Um, I mean, put it this way, I'll certainly put it right up there. But, you know, we've talked about what a puck hound he is and how his stick always seems to be in the right place. It was him getting his stick in that spot that put it right to Nemetskov in the slot for that slapper past Gorgiev. And at that point, I mean, it was on when it came to uh, the energy in the building. Um, of course, Colorado comes back with two quickies, including Nate McKinnon getting on the score sheet. And then the top line rising to the occasion to tie it up. I mean, it, it really was... It felt like an entire game in 20 minutes. Um, and I, I think we all knew, and certainly my conversations with folks at the at the intermission was, that was fun, but I'm pretty sure both coaches would maybe like to tone things down a little bit. Certainly a Rick bonus in the end. But there was no doubt that Colorado was going to keep on bringing it, and the Jets had to match that. And uh, listen, we've talked a lot about, you know, the the differences in these clubs. One, a high-flying offensive team. One, more known for their defense. When it came down to it last night, the difference was Connor Hellebuck being the much better goaltender. I know we can look and say he led in six goals. That is very un -Hellebuckian. He still made a bunch of big, big saves last night, Remus, and that is not something that Gorgiev did for the Avalanche. And the crazy thing was, and I didn't realize until we kind of got to the building and was going on, was that um, Ananen, the backup for Colorado, was not able to dress due to illness last night. I think it was former Moose Arvid Holm that was the backup last night. So... I mean, we'll find out tomorrow as to uh, Ananen's um, availability for the game. And I have to think that if he's good to go, Bedner probably goes there because um, the Winnipeg Jets are in Gorgiev's head. His game is not in a place where you can uh, win or his level of play is not in a place where you can win a series. We will all hope that we'll see Gorgiev out there for the avalanche last night. But you have to think that Colorado is already looking at other options as limited as they may, may be. Yeah, even though he had so many wins, uh, Georgia, of this year, um, his goals against, his save percentage was not very good. And his expected goals in the big big negative for them yesterday. Huh? So goaltending, you know, we talked about it was going to be a concern uh, for the Avalanche. It was. I know Hellebuck led in six. A couple of those, you know, the Jets talked about needing to tighten up. Uh, some of them on breakout passes that weren't crisp or, you know, trying to take it up the middle, you caused a turnover and... All of a sudden, it's a 2 on 0 on Hellbuck. I mean, the la the sixth goal on Hellbuck, one of the craziest goals I've ever seen. I think the puck bounced off his pad, off Lekkonen's stick, and then off Middlestat's stick, off Hellbuck, off Brendan Dillon's face, and in the back of the net for the sixth goal. Uh, watch that replay again, and you try to tell me uh, what happened. And, um, you know, they had a couple power plays. Um, it was Lekkonen with the tip in front, uh, Makar with the far wrister that I think went straight in through traffic. Uh, you know, I anticipate the Jets are going to clean things up, and yeah, I think you have to feel good that you got into this kind of high-scoring affair with Colorado, and you ended up outscoring them still. So, yeah, I, again, they're going to be better next game. They're going to clean up. I do have concern about them getting uh, outshot, but there was a stretch of time in the second period, maybe into the start of the first, where they played really well, and they have to figure out how to bottle up those, you know, 10, 20 minutes there and try to make it the full 60 because... I mean, six goals in the first period, one in the second, which uh, the Jets played well for the second, and six again in the third. <laughs> like, I mean, the craziest game. You haven't seen a 7-6 game in round one, game one of the playoffs since, uh, what is it, 1985 here. Uh, sorry, you haven't <laughs> seen two teams combined for 13 in the first game of a first-round playoff series since 85. So it was it was a throwback hockey, and it's funny. Like, in, a, in 2024... Or you have guys scoring, you know, 140 points a year. The Jets have the Vesna Trophy winner, who's uh, capable of neutralizing that. And you know, some of the comments are, well, you know, Avalanche would have won if they didn't have a bad goalie. Well, they do have a bad goalie, and the Jets have the best one. 
So, uh, you, you know, you're going to have to account for There's that. There's a lot of teams that could say, we would have won if we had Connor Hellebuck. Yeah. Guess what? You don't. The Winnipeg Jets do. And uh, even on a night where the goals against average doesn't look great and the save percentage might not be what you expect, he was a difference maker last night in keeping the team in the game, even though the score maybe looked a little closer than it was. Although, you know, they got that goal with just under eight minutes left to make it 7-5, and then it very much was game on. Um, middle stats scored that sort of weird one with 30 seconds left to maybe get the nerves up a bit more, but the Jets did the job in the final 30 seconds and got the job done. I have to say, Remus, the one guy we have not mentioned is the guy that, for my money, was the first star. I believe he was the first star in the building who once again has raised his level of play significantly at the most important time of the year. Of course, I'm talking about the captain, Adam Lowry, who is in playoff beast mode form, going head-to-head -head with McKinnon on most shifts, scoring. The goal that he scored in the second period reminded me of the goal that he scored previous Saturday uh, against, uh, against the Colorado Avalanche. And then in the third period, to get things going on one of the more bizarre plays that you will see, a puck, I mean, just a brilliant play by Lowry to go around the net minder to kind of jam it in. He hit the outside post, which then went across, hit the other post, and it basically knuckleballed off of the, off of the second post backwards, at one point was in, and then was out. And it took a little while to confirm that it was a goal, but I can tell you when the referee said the puck did go across the line, it was 5-3. At that point, it was on. And then when Kyle Connor scored to make it 6-3, 5-51 into the third, that was the moment when I tweeted out, we might need to get maintenance to the top of Canada Life Center because it felt like the roof was about to blow off. Yeah, I think Adam Lowry, uh, I mean, is it too early? Can you call round one, game on game, like an iconic game or a statement game? Like, I feel like this is going to be a game we'll be talking about for a while, but Adam oh, Lowry... no one's forgetting this one yeah. for a long time. Like, I'll tell you that much. Did he posterize Nathan McKinnon driving to the front of the net on that one? And you talk about playoff Adam yes, Lowry. Yes, he did. That was 29. Put the it, guy that's going to win the Hart Trophy. <laughs> put, him on, put that one on a poster. But Adam Lowry in his last six playoff games has six goals, one assist. Uh, the guy comes out to play uh, in the playoff. We saw him down the stretch last year. Not known as an offensive guy, but... I mean, this is the tight playoffs. You bring out these tough, grinding games. Uh, he was a scorer in junior and, and had to adjust his game to become, you know, one of the best shutdown centers in the league. But he's a leader on this team. Uh, they all, you know, they all look up to him. Hellbuck had some nice things to say today. Maybe we'll get to that clip later on. But I mean, what a what a game for him. You know, scoring on the with the two on one there, shooting it through, and uh, just taking it hard to the net. And yeah, you don't see that too. I was actually surprised they. Oh, they called it a goal. I wasn't sure if there was enough to overturn, but the image is out there where you can see white. Although I'm always nervous about, like, is it, well, is it that angle that makes it look like it's in, but it's not? But, hey, they called it a goal, and you'll take it. And yeah, the place went went nuts. And I got to say, like, <laughs> I like I feel like my ears and just that, the high you feel today, I feel like I was at, like, an unbelievable rock concert, like a stadium show, but it was an arena hockey game for only round one game one i mean the feeling uh in the city after that and just you know just being there was is incredible like i'm, oh. I'm already looking forward to game two it's crazy it's only game one it's crazy yeah downtown just i mean aside from the actual game like the vibes around everything downtown yesterday was you know was incredible and listen we knew it would be that way beforehand um but to win in such an exciting fashion um, and, you know, you, you left the building. It was still relatively light outside. People were in, in very high spirits. All the bars were full pretty much afterwards. We went in and had a couple of Shannons. It was a heck of a great time there afterwards. Um, and that's just game one, folks. We're going to do it all over again tomorrow, late night, 8.30, probably about an 8.45 puck drop we're expecting tomorrow. Uh, for the game here in Winnipeg. Just before we, uh, we hear from uh, Rick Bonus and Adam Lowry, a few notes that Remus cracked up. Dylan DeMello led the team in ice time with 25 minutes, career high in a playoff game that ended in regulation. Kyle Connor with his third career multi-goal playoff game, is his first since 2019 against the Blues. 
second career three-point playoff game for Connor, and his third career playoff game-winning goal, second in franchise history. Uh, Brandon Dillon had a nice game. He finished plus three, tying a franchise record for best plus minus in a playoff game. And Adam Lowry played his 45th career playoff game, passing Blake Wheeler for possession of first in franchise history. Um, listen, just before we get to Bones and the Clips, I mentioned right off the bat a big WST welcome to the gang at Rollies Transfer. Great to have Rollies on board. They are, of course, the uh, family owned and operated for over 60 years and the most trusted name in moving in Winnipeg and Southern Manitoba. As I mentioned, they've been doing it for decades. And you know, part of what makes Roly Services the um, best and most affordable is just how connected they are throughout Southern Manitoba, more than just Winnipeg. Their logistics business brings them all around the province, and that means you get the best rates and the most flexible timing to make your moves, whether you're in the city or outside the city. They've got a great new website, and Remus has it up right now. You can see it at rollies.com, R-O-L-L-Y-S, um, and they've got a great request a quote function. Very simple with a quick turnaround. So if you want the experts at Rollies to make that move a heck of a lot easier for you at a great price, simply go to Rollies.com, request a quote. They'll turn it around and get back in touch with you right away. And uh, hey, doing it for over 60 years, it tells you something. Great to have Rollies on board. And again, Manitoba's trusted, most trusted name in moving services for over 60 years. Go to Rollies.com to find out more and request your quote today. Um, Got to shout out our friends at Consolidated Supply. Beautiful outside today. We know there's a lot of work happening around spring, and uh, hey, the gang Consolidated Supply have so many ways they can help you, your residents, or your business as the leaders in art, uh, irrigation systems, artificial turf, the exclusive club car dealer in Manitoba for golf carts, both new and used, and other great options for your property, including hot tubs and amazing outdoor kitchens. And of course, they're the leaders in small engine parts and repair. Pop by and see them at the showroom, open to the public, 1395 Nyako Road East, or find out more online at cte.ca. And hey, speaking of those golf carts, need a great deal on a golf cart battery or more as you get ready for spring and summer, particularly if you're in farming or construction or whatnot, now's the time to let Donnie and the gang at Manitoba Battery take care of you. Shopping local with the best prices in town. Of course, they've got the new store at 452 Dover Court. And right now, their spring sale is on uh, with their already industry-leading prices even lower on particular things like what you need for the, your big, for the big trucks to power you through the business season for farming and construction. As we mentioned, those golf cart batteries as well. Heck of a deal. $129.99 right now. Uh, but your best bet is to go to manitobabattery.com. Check out all the great deals. And don't forget, Donnie and the gang will deliver to you for free anywhere in the city of Winnipeg with any purchase over 60 bucks. And hey, I saw a lot of very interesting haircuts and hairstyles. And yes, some white dues as well last night. You want to take care of your lettuce for the playoffs, the whiteout, or just to look great, get on down to Modern Man Barbershop. Eight locations in Winnipeg, including the newest locations on Pembina Highway and Plessy Road. They've got you covered with great haircuts, shaves, beard shaping, color services, and more. What you need to do is make an appointment and book your look via modernmanbarber.com. All right, Remo, let's get to the jet dressing room. We'll start off with the head coach. Rick Bonus, uh, he might have needed a stiff Canadian club after that one last night. Uh, here's what Bones had to say about the 7 6 win for the Jets yesterday. Listen, we'll never complain about a win, especially this time of year. Uh, so we're very happy to get that win and understanding that there's areas that we're, we're going to be better, and we will. There's things we're going to clean up. It wasn't exactly how we drew it up, but if that's the way it goes, that's the way it goes. Our, our top guys, uh, you know, they their top guys took over. Our top guys took over. It wasn't... Uh, um, yeah, it was just the type of game that it evolved into, and then you you play it out, and you know, we found a way to get the the win. So we'll take it. The things you're talking about cleaning up, uh, is it like a 
long laundry list, or is it just maybe a couple themes that need some tweaking? It's it's a couple of specific things we can clean up, and there's um, we'll just need some better performances too. So those are those things will be addressed. We'll, we'll clean it up. We'll be better on uh, the next game. We'll be better Tuesday. All right, there's Bones, who, um, you know, when they're going through the video, there's probably a lot of things that are going to make him want to pull his hair out. Um, but there is an acceptance that sometimes things don't go exactly the way that you draw them up, Reem. And uh, the bottom line was uh, the Winnipeg Jets found a way to get it done. And you have to think that, you know, the start, the offensive start for the club bodes very well going forward. We've talked about the issues in the Avalanche net but for so many players to feel a part of a big offensive explosion like that, uh, you clean up some of that puck management on the other side, and that can be a pretty dangerous team. Yeah, coming in the game, if you say, hey, uh, you know, you gave up six goals to the Avalanche, you're probably not feeling so good. But then you find out you scored seven, uh, then, yeah, that's even better. And, uh, you know, the power play went one for two. I thought they were moving the puck uh, really well, even on that first one they didn't score on. Your top players are being your top players, and you're getting contribution scoring from Adam, Adam Lowry as well. So, if, I mean, if you took anyone in this game in your uh, fantasy playoffs, uh, I'm sure you're doing pretty well as, you know, 13 combined goals leads to a lot of points. But, I mean, this isn't going to be – every game isn't going to be like this. So we'll have to see how they do, you know, clean things up, to use a bonus term, in game two. But you take the win – uh, you move on and try to get back to playing Winnipeg Jets hockey. That led you to being the Jennings Trophy winner. Speaking of, yes, those playoff pools, shout out to Ezzy Ginsberg from Illegal Curve who hosted his annual playoff draft on Friday night. And you know that I picked the captain, Adam Lowry. He's, I mean, if you feel like the Jets have a good chance on going on a run, you're wanting to pick players from that club and, I mean, I don't know if there's a guy that I feel more confident that is going to step up and make big plays and big moments than the captain, even though he's capable of going long droughts without scoring during the regular season. This is Adam Lowry's time, and uh, Bones talked about playoff Lowry last night after the 7-6 win. Well, I, again, he's he's been a great leader for the team on and off the ice. So he's, he's a, he was a great choice for captain. Um, but again, he he loves these challenges. He's going up against one of the best players in the world, not necessarily the league, the league, but the world. And and and, and Nate. So uh, he loves those challenges, and he just he takes his game to another level. If you, the intensity is always there. Um, it was certainly there tonight, and it's nice to see him get rewarded with a couple of goals because he worked incredibly hard. And that you're playing against the McKinnon line, you're going to have to work very, very hard, and you're going to have to be very, very smart. And Adam did those things for us tonight. All right, Bones on the captain last night. Um, <laughs> here's the coach um, talking about winning a game where they uncharacteristically had six go in their net. We were resilient tonight. We were. We found a way. Um, you know, the, the goals we gave up in the first were a little, a little too easy for them. Uh, well, we kind of gave them those goals. So, uh, but we also recognized it, and that's just, that. That's very, very important that we recognize. Okay, that was on us. Yeah. Let's clean these things up. We cleaned them up in the second period for the most part, um, and then you know they they took it to another level and in the third and we knew that was going to come and we bent a little we broke a couple of times but uh again we listen give the guys credit we found a way to win a, a game that wasn't wasn't structured it wasn't played out the way it was it was supposed to be structured right. so find a way and we'll take that every day yeah certainly easier to laugh after getting the win not sure many of the things that happened in that game were a laughing matter to bones but um you know you you, you you work on it, you, you fix up the things that, that didn't go well, try and focus in on what does and uh, see where it can take you. I, I did have to laugh at this one, though. Mike McIntyre asked Bones uh, if he was able to enjoy it and have fun last night. Is there any part of a game like this where a little part of Rick Bonus is sitting back thinking this is, this is just 
this is fun, this is crazy. I didn't have time tonight. Yeah. <laughs> there, was, there was too much going on at both ends. But, yeah, and listen, yeah, again, they've got some elite players over there, and they are fun to watch. They are. I mean, but you can't get caught up in that, right, in, in these games. Maybe in October, but not now. And uh, it's an on-ice awareness. You know they're on the ice, and you want to make sure you've got the right guys on the ice with them. And as we mentioned, listen, McKinnon's line plays so much, one line's not going to do it. So Mark's line was out there some with them, and Sean's line was out there sometimes with them. And, um, yeah, there's just certain things we're going to clean up. All right, so uh, there's Bones. Now, this is a shorter one, but this is the Lowry goal review. And, and Reem, like, we talked about this beforehand. I have to admit, like... So we were sitting in row one of the 200s and had a very good view at that. And from where I was sitting, it certainly looked like it was in and there was white. But the guy right beside me thought it didn't go in. So I was surprised at how quick the uh, the call came. Here's what Bones had to say about the Lowry goal review. Yeah, well, fortunately, we did get a quick review. Matt and James were in their room, and they got it up there quickly. And we, I looked down, and I said, see this puck rolling on his edge. you are inside the line. Okay, it's in. Take it and run. Um, obviously, it didn't take too long for the co- for the referee to point to center ice and say, good goal, 5-3. That one, though, Rima, one of the more bizarre playoff goals I can remember since the Jets came back. Yeah, I mean, I'm in the, up in high in the press box i thought it was in but then you're like maybe not but yeah hit the one post went to the other post and it rolled all the way back and was it a third post like <laughs> just about a triple doink as someone just said in chat yeah just about and i was like how did the ref call this no goal but you watch the replay i don't blame him at all and i'm again kind of surprised they were able to overturn it but <clears throat> there is the picture out there i saw elliot friedman uh tweeting it out today even saying hey this is this is what it looked like in here. Check this out. Us, uh, in case you didn't know, this was the puck. Uh, it is circled here in this picture. <laughs> there is a little white. But again, you don't know about the angle or not. It could make it look nice like it is. Nice to see one of these go the Jets way. Mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> God knows they've had a few go the, uh, go the other way. Hey, by the way, big, big thanks to uh, our pal Ryland Bazinet who uh, just popped in a super chat. Happy to be part of the WSD team from Rollies Transfer. Ryland, pop to have you, Ryan, and the entire Rollies team on board with us. Uh, really do appreciate the support. Great to have you guys with us on just such an exciting day for Jet fans here in the city of Winnipeg after that win last night. Um, here's just a couple more from Bones. I do want to hear from Connor Hellebuck, but here's Bones on what they need to clean up. So all three zones and puck, puck management and, and all three zones when they're coming, when they're carrying the puck in like they were tonight, then we're clearly off our game. And uh, if you turn the puck over, your structure is going to break down like right away. So it's puck management and um, yeah, it's just a little more about playing the right way at the right time. Yeah, definitely got away with a few last night. And, uh, you know, as we said, uncharacteristic number beside Connor Hellebuck. The number that mattered the most, though, was the win. Here's what Bones had to say about his goaltender. Huge, you're not tagging any of those goals on, on him. Some of them had seeing eyes. Some of them were bouncing all over the place. So some of them were just dead giveaways on our on our part. So you're not hanging any of those on him. Uh, we're, we're, that could even could have been worse, right? <laughs> Seriously, I mean, we don't give up that many chances. We don't give up that many shots, and 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 Connor had to play a lot better, and um, yeah, he had to, he made a lot of big saves at the right time, which he always does. I'm not hanging any of those goals on him. All right, high praise for the Jets MVP from uh, from their head coach. Speaking of Hellebuck, he actually spoke this morning. Um, and <laughs> I'm looking forward to hearing this. I have not heard this yet, but um, Hellebuck talked about uh, how or whether he was able to wind down after such a crazy game to get the playoffs going last night. Still doing it. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's uh, game ones are always extra adrenaline, extra, uh, you know, you just put a little more into it. It's not easy to wind down after that. Um, thankfully, I have all day today and um, late game tomorrow, so I have plenty of time. So are you up late last night, kind of going through the game, or when you get home? No, I'm more just getting my recovery in, um, getting my fluids in. Uh, that was probably one of the mo- 
most sweatiest games I've played <laughs> in this league yesterday. So um, there's a few extra things I had to do, but for the most part, it was just slowly winding down and you know watching highlights from some other games, seeing what's going on around the league, and you know, just relaxing. Yeah, definitely some relaxing was needed. By the way, Reem, those Stanley Cup playoff hoodies that the Jets are wearing with their number on like the Eddie from Iron Maiden with the with the fighter helmet on, maybe the coolest ones I've seen in the National Hockey League. Those are unreal. Usually they just have the uh what the pick the number on there. And I saw John Lou tweeted out, yeah, here's I'll get a nice close up. Shout out to John Lou. We're tweeting it out. Oh, look at this. This is, yeah, the skull. This is Nikolai Ehlers' one. Uh, the skull there with the number. And they do auction these off after the game, after the playoffs. And I remember last year we were looking at, but I think if you have something like that on there, makes them a bit unique. You know, it's got the plane. I don't know, ace is high, Eddie, I think. So uh, pretty awesome. I was ripping some uh, Iron Maiden on the weekend, too, trying to get my son... <laughs> Who's who's five into the trooper, but uh, we'll we'll get there. But yeah, I mean this is, makes it unique. You know they're buying in. They got the give the jackets out after the game as well. So uh, love it. Yeah. By the way, Kenny's water bottle. A uh, good game recap last night. Remo and Connor. Yeah, the boys with the suits. I'm sure if you haven't checked it out and you need more WST content, Connor and Remo did a great. Uh, Great stand-up at the end of the game. I consumed that as soon as I got home, in addition to uh, all our other friends in the space doing what they do after the game last night. Um, here's a little bit more from Hellebuck, though. Um, listen, the numbers didn't look great, but it's about winning. Hellebuck talked about not caring too much about stats at this time of the year. This time of year, who cares about stats, really? Um, stats are just going to be something people look at and pick apart and talk about, really. At the end of the day, it's... Did you win or did you not win? And uh, we're going to keep saying that over and over again. And you guys are probably going to keep writing about the the fine details. But, you know, at the end of the day, 16 wins win the Stanley Cup. And that's my goal. So who really cares about everything else that goes with it? Yeah, one down, 15 to go for Connor Hellebuck. Here's one more from Helly. Uh, on, we talked about Adam Lowry stepping up. Two massive goals last night. Going head-to-head -head with McKinnon. Here's Helly on uh, Lowry as the leader of the Winnipeg Jets. I think he's got a very strong opinion, and it's a good opinion. Like, he's not going to go and just blow smoke up your butt. He's going to give you his honest opinion, and if you're looking for some honesty, he's giving it to you. Um, he's not a liar at all, which is great for a leader. Um, he's going to give you exactly what you need and what this group needs. Uh, and he showed it with his play last night. He, he put it all out there, and I think it's just a guy that's been so dialed in his career, and he's just been getting better and better and better and realizes how important his role is and plays his role to a T. Uh, I don't think there's many guys out there that do such a job like that and are so okay with being perfect in their role, if that makes sense, because I, I, I believe that he knows his role and he strives to be perfect in it. All right, that was great stuff from Connor Hellebuck. Speaking about the captain of the Winnipeg Jets, Adam Lowry. Lowry, as we mentioned, had a monster game and was the uh, first star. Here's uh, Lowry on just the crazy style of the game that probably wasn't the way they drew up. I don't think Bones is going to be preaching 7-6. So. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think the start, they, they had a great start. You know, maybe a little nervous energy. We were excited uh, getting the white out and having home ice and getting to, to play in front of our fans. and. You know, the, I think just moving the puck, we, we didn't get the puck through the neutral zone early. Hell, had to make some big saves. Um, but, you know, we, we were able to settle in. Uh, I, I think it's just, you know, we gave them some easy offense early, and, and you know, we'll, we'll have to make some adjustments on the, the penalty kill, six on five, things like that. But, um, you know, I, I, I think you know, we got to do a better job just staying on top of their speed. They, they come through the neutral zone so well um they have an active back end and they, they generate a lot there so um you know i just f3 got caught a few times uh you know pucks inside the blue line ours and theirs um you know it gave them some of that those chances that a little uncharacteristic for our group so um it's a great team over there they, they scored a lot of goals um we know they've got great offensive talent so 
um, we're, we're happy with the result. I think you know both teams still have areas they, they'll want to clean up, though. All right, a little bit more from the captain before we bring in Jeff Hamilton. Um, here's Lowry on the review of his second goal that started the uh, six-goal uh, fiesta of scoring in the third period. Yeah, honestly, like from my angle, I felt like I could see a piece of white, but looking at the replay now, I'm, I'm like, why was I so confident? But, uh, coming back to the bench today, they seem to think it was pretty conclusive, pretty solid right away. So uh, you, n- you never know, though. It's, it's a little tense waiting for the confirmation, but uh, it was nice that uh, it just got enough. Yeah, just enough. Uh, it was a bizarre one, but it went the Jets' way last night. Uh, here's the captain. We heard Hellebuck talk about Adam Lowry as the captain. Here's Adam Lowry on Hellebuck being the last line of defense for the Winnipeg Jets. His stats aren't going to jump out at you, but you know, Bones always says timely saves, and you know, the goalies are like, oh, saves a save. But, uh, um, you know, I, I think the start, especially early on, they were shooting us 10 11 1. Uh, he, he makes some saves, but he, he swallows up some pucks where he he's allow, allows us to catch our breath. I think um, you know, he gives up six, two two are on the power play, ones with the net empty. So he, it kind of skews his stat line a little bit. But you know he, he's been our MVP. He should get consideration for the heart. He's he's had such an amazing year. He, he's so important for our team. So um, you know another solid game for Helly. So um, no concerns there. All right, one more from the captain after the, those uh, words about his netminder. Um, this is just about Lowry on being able to contribute to the offense in the fashion that he did last night at the most important time of the year. Uh, you know, the, the offense was nice. I think anytime you, you can get some against those guys, it's great. It's, you know, what we gave up. I think we spent a lot of time on our end. Uh, you know, we gave some up off the rush. I think I look back at that first shift in the third period where um, – you know, at the, he rings one off the post. Uh, you know, they get some chances like that. So, um, with that being, you know, I think we want to spend a little more time in their, their zone. You know, wear them down on the cycle. I think there, there's going to be some tweaks, and you know, maybe at some times in the game we were a little tentative. We were trying to be, you know, so cautious that we were over top that we were late on the forecheck. And you know, anytime you're late on the forecheck, you, you allow some easy outlet passes, and that's where their speed can really hurt you. So. Uh, j- just some quicker reads, I think, you know, it kind of is where our line will look to, to be a little better in, in game two. Oh. We're not just for the showboats or the champions. We're here for the good ones. The ones who work hard and show up for others not to get recognized, but because it's the right thing to do. We'd like to think that our good intentions show up in our beer. We keep working to perfect it, not because we want fame or fanfare, but because you deserve it. 1919, the good you deserve. Yes, there were certainly a few celebratory 1919s enjoyed in downtown Winnipeg after that one last night. Cheers to our friends at Little Brown Jug. A big thanks to our the gang at Wallace and Wallace, the fencing and overhead door specialist in Winnipeg for over 70 years. Uh, you know, with the change of the seasons, there's a lot of plans for big projects right now. And when you're thinking fencing in Winnipeg, it's always Wallace and Wallace. Um, what you need to do, uh, your best bet is go to wallacefences.com for more information on everything available to you and give them a phone call at 452-2700. Um, one of the experts at Wallace and Wallace can come down and give you a free estimate. Um, but time is of the essence right now. As, as busy as Wallace and Wallace get, gets, they will be doing installations beginning probably this week. And the sooner you can get that order in, the sooner you and your family will be enjoying a beautiful Manitoba summer on your side of a brand new fence. For all of your fencing and overhead door needs, it's Wallace and Wallace. You can go online, as I mentioned, wallacefences.com or pop down and see them at their showroom on Lawson Crescent, just off of Keniston. Um, There were a lot of great suits in the uh, building last night. And uh, guys, if you need to up your menswear game for the whiteout or 
the rest of life. You know where to go. It's F Apparel at 190 Smith Street downtown, just down the street from Canada Life Center. F Apparel has amazing custom suits starting at just 400 bucks, along with chinos, golf pants, custom shirts, both tucked and untucked styles, and an incredible selection of menswear accessories. Don't forget a 15% discount for wedding parties. They've also got a great promotion for high school graduates who need a suit for the big day that they can wear moving forward into the next chapter of their life. Find out more and make an appointment at F, that's E-P-H, apparel.com, and pop down and see him at 190 Smith Street. Then I uh, have big cheers to the gang at Aikens Lake Wilderness Lodge. They are ramping up for a huge summer if you're looking for an amazing fly-in fishing experience in Manitoba where you can be on the water in less than two hours from the city of Winnipeg. Aikens is the spot, an amazing corporate retreat or corporate outing, or, of course, just a great spot to go with friends and family to paradise for a few days. And, hey, as great as the fishing is, the world-class hospitality might be even better from the Turan family. Find out more, AikensLake.com, on availabilities for the 2024 season. All right, we have a lot to get to. With our next guest, uh, seven six in game one, just the way they wrote uh, wrote it up. Let's bring in the hammer himself, Jeff Hamilton, from the Winnipeg Free Press. What's going on? How uh, how was the weekend, and how did you enjoy that one last night? What a game, man! What a what a roller coaster! I I I don't. I think probably everyone has this thought, and I I feel for for the the hardcore fans out there because that one wouldn't have been easy for the uh, the old ticker. You know, I, I think there were times where they they thought they could tuck you to bed with a you know a big smile, and of course it needed to go all the way down to the final seconds. But you know, at the end of the day, Jets strike blood first, as you mentioned. Huss wasn't the way they drew it up, but uh, steal the words from Connor Hellebuck, a win's a win. Nobody cares about stats. They just want, uh, to be on that winning side. And that would have been a mass. And that was a massive one. I mean, that was a track meet. They didn't want to get into a track meet. They got into a track meet, uh, and it could have very easily ended up on the other side, but some great performances from the jets, some, certainly some resiliency, some, um, pushback after I thought was a, was a fairly slow start to the game, of course. But at the end of the day, the jets are in the winner's circle and, while, you know, they're feeling really, really good about themselves, they're feeling really, really good about their teammates, lots of joy in that locker room afterwards, um, you can only imagine what it would have looked like had they been on the other end of that. So, yep, so far so good, man. My weekend overall is probably is not as good as the Jets, but pretty darn close. I had a, I had a great one. Well, and, 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 and I mean, just... Certainly wasn't as wild. Yeah, well, yeah, you would have had to go on a pretty serious bender to even come close to what the Jets went through last night. That's between me and my diary, all right? Yeah, <laughs> it was wild. It was just so great to see downtown the way that um, the way everybody came out last night. I was in the plaza beforehand, um, and I think the majority of people that were there early were there and then going into the game, um, but there was a great crowd. I had some friends that were there for it, and from where my seats were, we'd go out into the concourse facing the street party, and um, it seemed like, you know, the, the, the street party, and listen, we know how expensive tickets are and how difficult it is to get them. That really has seemed like it has turned to the place for young Winnipeggers and Manitobans and Jet fans to get together. And they were having a hell of a time last night. And then in the building, I mean, that was the white knuckle ride that Rick Bonus probably didn't want. But certainly, as long as the team won, will be one of the most uh, incredible playoff experiences people will uh, remember for a long time. And Jeff, what I didn't really talk about this before, and maybe I didn't want to think about it, it had been a long time since this team had won in front of home fans at the whiteout. And uh, that, I think, is significant as well. Because, listen, not just for the fans, but I think the team, there's a lot of, there had been some scar tissue in the past that hopefully they got over last night. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what was it, the 2018 run the last time that yeah. the Jets won in front of a full building? Of course, we, you know, there were those games against Edmonton, but they were in front of nobody or handful of people, if I can recall. It feels so long ago. Um, yeah, massive one. And and you know what I thought? If you look at look at that game, I mean, certainly there are things that you're going to look at, and, and, and guys said it after the game, particularly Adam Lowry, that, you know, this isn't going to be a – you know, they're not going to make an all-star game blush in every game of this series. You know, like it's not going to be a 13-goal a goal affair. Um, you know, the, the beauty or the good news, I think, for the Winnipeg Jets is is a lot of their mistakes seem fixable. Like, I, I just don't 
I don't think you can say the same thing for the Colorado Avalanche. I think the Colorado Avalanche got into what exactly what they wanted out of a game. And the fact that they were able to, you know, put six goals behind the best goaltender in the world, more often than not, you think you're, you know, you're going to be on the, the winning end of that side. And, and clearly that wasn't the case. So, you know, I think the Jets, whether it's, you know, the whiteout curse, which I think I was hearing about for a little bit there, um, you know, maybe that's broken, whatever, but it certainly, I think it, you know, especially when you consider what this season looked like, right? When you look at all the attendance chat, the, you know, I would say clumsy interviews from Mark Chipman, not really getting his message out and having to redo them. You know, I, it, it, it you know, it kind of, you know, it was a little bit of a, a pull back in an otherwise great season and the Jets weren't doing that great after that. So it just kind of seemed a bit magnified and then they go on this run. They're feeling really good. I don't think the Jets entered this, this, playoff series as the you know i guess it, uh, if you look at the gambling sites they were they were you know seen as underdogs that's changed really quickly if you go to those odds but um you know i i think there was a lot of pressure on this team heading into this game i don't think you know that while they could certainly look at the you know the frauds comment that you know was, was talked about uh you know a heck of a lot out of the spit and chicklets podcast and ryan whitney i mean they can talk you know call themselves the fraud squad i saw that on twitter i thought that was awesome um, you know, but I don't think that they, they don't believe that they're, you know, the underdogs in this. And I think there was a lot of pressure to go into it. And the fact that they had the big, long winning streak, um, you know, a lot of people, the narrative changed. I mean, what, you know, what is, what do I say every time I come on here, you don't like the narrative, change it. That's exactly what the Jets did. Wait a couple of days. They, they went from, they went from being the team that nobody was really considering as contenders to on the eve of the playoffs. I don't even want to see a lot of people's dark horses. I think they were, people were looking at this team and, and looking at their built and, you know, their depth and the fact that they don't have a guy like Cole Perfetti in the lineup, um, just based on numbers, you know, obviously Connor Hellebuck being the best goalie in the world, uh, you know, depth at forward end on defense. And all of a sudden the pressure was there. So for them to come out and wait, you know, wade through some of the early, early pains, you know, you meant uh, Adam Lowry mentioned it. I think there was a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of excitement from the full building to start off. I think the Jets were a little bit starstruck, if you will. Uh, the stage was a little bit big. I think they felt they played a little bit tentatively, allowed the you know Colorado to do what they do best, and that's you know enter the zone with full speed, and you know it cost them a little bit at the beginning, but. Overall, they settled in, um, didn't get into a game that they wanted to, you know, exactly the style they wanted to get into. But there were a lot of great performances, man. I mean, go up and down the lineup. I mean, I thought Connor Hellebuck, despite letting in six goals, played terrific. Uh, all things considered, it could have been worse. Of course, Adam Lowry had a solid game. That line had a solid game. Their responsibility is to shut down, you know, Nathan McKinnon. Uh, I don't think offense was, you know, certainly is welcome, but it wasn't necessary. But, of course, they, they get on the, the sheet a couple times. You look at... That first line, I thought that was the best game Kyle Connor might have played all season, perhaps as a Winnipeg Jet. He looked engaged. He looked he looked like he was, you know, game time. And uh, you know, same thing for for Mark Shifley. We said this before. This team is going to go as far as Mark Mark Shifley takes them, and that was a solid effort from him. Gabriel Velarde as well. Fourth line chips in with a goal. So you know, while there wasn't well, it wasn't exactly the way you know anyone would have dri- uh, drawn it up. You know, particularly Rick Bonus. Uh, there were a lot of positives to come out of an otherwise game that could have easily ended up on the other side for the Jets. Yeah, and you know what? I mean, Ehlers was the one guy that uh, I thought was really dangerous last night but mm. didn't end up getting on the score sheet. Um, but literally everyone, and I mean, as far as the blue line goes, I mean, Dylan DeMello log in 20 minutes, Josh Morrissey with the early goal and playing big, big minutes against the top players on Colorado. Uh, they uh, They definitely did a great job. By the way... We've got over 800 in chat right now. For any of you that are new, that have just jumped on board and uh, found us, uh, make sure to hit that subscribe button and join us every day, 1 o'clock Central, Monday to Friday, for the latest on Winnipeg sports. And as long as the Jets are in the playoffs, it will be heavily focused on the whiteout and what's happening with the Jets. I see a funny one in chat from John Gianta. What's up, Johnny? I fear my guy Andrew sold his soul for a Chiefs Super Bowl and it might affect my Jets. No, you know what I did? I brought my uh, Mahomes Showtime koozie yesterday just for a little extra, some championship vibes uh, to come along. And I saw Liss and the gang speaking. I mean, we all know that once the Chiefs' kingdom united with the Swifties, it was over for the rest of the NFL. Saw a lot of young Jet fans making their own kind of Taylor Swift-style Jets playoff bracelets or whatever. So 
I mean, it's all coming together, and it came together last night in a 7-6 win that I think we will all remember. By the way, shout out to uh, Mark and Dupiak. Uh, thank you very much for the super chat. The Winnipeg Jets need to finish the story. Well, the story just got going last night. With As Connor Hellebuck said, you need 16 wins. They got one, and they go back tomorrow. Jeff, um, the most interesting, well, or probably horrifying part of last night's game from an avalanche standpoint was the fact that their guy who led the NHL in wins in the season cannot seem to make a big save, at least right now, or certainly against the Winnipeg Jets, compounded with the fact that Anunen wasn't even dressed for the game last night and former Moose Arvid Holm was the backup. Um, the, 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 the way things shook out, the Avalanche scoring six and losing in game one, and the performance of Gorgiev has to be uh, incredibly concerning, to say the least, for Jared Bednar and the staff of Colorado. Look, we all know how important confidence is, is in this game. It's even even more important when you consider playing the most important position on the ice, and that, of course, being goaltender. I mean, that was you're right. I mean, this was a guy who recorded the most amount of wins in the in the league, one more than Connor Hellebuck, um, backed by a great Colorado Avalanche team, obviously, and and. Um, you know, if I'm not mistaken, was an all-star at the all-star game this year. I'm not a, I'm not a regular watcher at the all-star game, but punched his ticket to that. And now later in the, in the year, the narrative, you know, things change, things shift. And this has been an issue now for a couple of weeks for that, for that goaltender. And there was a lot of question marks going into the game, uh, of whether he was going to be able to perform the irony in it, Huss, was that after it was three, three, I thought he made some pretty critical saves for his team. Um, I thought he, I thought he showed up pretty big. And then, of course, started to let them in again. And and some of those goals, particularly, like even if you look at Kyle Connor's goal, I mean, I think that was clocked at 81 miles per hour. That's his sweet spot there. That's going in a part of the net that usually would hit a goalie's shoulder if he was if he was in position. So you know, obviously, he's fighting it. If you saw his post game comments, didn't want to discuss it all that much. Wanted to put it behind him. But you look at Jared Bednar's comments after the game, and of course, you know, he's not going to dump on his goaltender after game one of. Of, a, of, a, of the first round series, but he did he did note that this team needs a, an extra you know needs a save here or there. I wonder what the psyche of his teammates are thinking. Um, we know how competitive Nathan McKinnon is. I'm not suggesting Nathan McKinnon would you know rou- you know rouse his goalie like that or anything like. But they're competitors, and you know there's the reality is is their goaltending let them down. When you have a sub 700 save percentage in a game that's seven six, there's only so many places that you can look. Uh, Hammer, uh, what the issue is. Hammer, here, this is just for folks that maybe missed it. This is Bednar yeah. um, post game yesterday discussing the performance of his netminder. Um, it was, it was, um, need, it probably needed to be better, right? Like, I thought we played well, we, we created some chances, um, he made some good saves, but we're going to need like a couple more saves than that probably to win, you know? So, it, but it is what it is. We'll regroup. It wasn't. Like we made some mistakes in front of them that we'll have to clean up and try to get the job done. It's a team game. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you, you, you preach the team game, which it is, but if, you're, uh, if your goalie's in a bad place, that can be a big, big hill to climb, and it sort of seems that's where Colorado is. And it, it's going to be fascinating to see whether they go right back to him in game number two. Do they go with Ananen, what his status for the game is? Right. Uh, and the bottom line is, assuming that Gorgiev gets back in the net at some point, can he be significantly better than he was yesterday and he was last Saturday against the Winnipeg Jets? Because if that doesn't change, it, it does seem like it's a pretty tough hill to climb considering the guy in the other net that I don't think has given up six anymore. Yeah, so here's the issue. If Ananen's ready to go, I mean, you look at a lot of the reporters out in Denver, and now I'm not saying reporters choose who's in net. In fact, they have zero say. I can say from personal experience, but um, you know, a lot of them are talking about you can't put Gorgia back in the series again. But the question needs to be: if Adenin's health isn't there, like is him at eighty percent better than Gorgia at a hundred percent? I mean, that's kind of the decision you might be making. But also, if you do decide to go with Adenin and, and, and sit Gorgia, did you just kill his confidence forever? Like, did you just like is he just going to sit? Like, what kind of player is he? What kind of person is he is he going to be able to deal with that and so it's obviously a big question you know the other question you need to weigh is if he is going to be as bad as he was in game one can you afford to give away game two 
And I mean, maybe there's a shorter leash. Personally, I think you go back to him. I don't think you go back to him with, you know, I think you try to coach him up a little bit like you have the last couple of weeks. And, you know, Jets fans are going to be smiling at that, I'm sure. But I think you, you, you let him go back in, but you give him a short leash. Because I, I, I truly believe that if you go to Ananin and then you trust that he's, I mean, good sample, good size, good stats, small sample size. Um, but if you do choose to go with him and he, he lays an egg, now you're in, you know, now you're juggling two pretty, you know, pretty rough goalies. And I, you know, to Bednar's case or comments, the abs didn't play incredibly well again in front of him. It wasn't like, I mean, they did limit the Jets to 23 shots, which is, which is pretty good, but I don't, you know, they weren't a defensive juggernaut by any stretch of the imagination. And so um, maybe with a little bit renewed commitment to defense, he could, he will be able to get out of that funk. It's just, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a question that no coach wants to have after game one of the, of the first round of the Stanley cup playoffs. It's an unfortunate situation. It's been one that has been brewing now, like I said, for a few weeks and now it's kind of come to, okay, there was seven nothing game before he was pulled out of that one. Luckily, now there's a six a seven goal effort here. Arbor at home, you don't even want to put in. So maybe you do move to a second goalie. I just think it's a bit panic right now. And and while it might cost you if you put Gorgia back in net, I just don't think you let it get to that point. I mean, he might get one two depending on the style of goals that are being scored. I think you you know you got to allow him to get back in that crease. I just think for the overall team psyche. That being said. Jared Bednar and knows this team significantly better than I know this team, obviously, and would 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 know better at what he can do, what he can say, how he can challenge his goaltender, uh, and then obviously make a decision that's the best case for his team to to fight and even this series at one apiece. But here's the other thing, Huss. If you put him back in net in Winnipeg, you think the fans are going to be any less kind? <laughs> like it's going to be from the start of the puck drop. And so you have to I think you have to take that into consideration where you really do get that home ice advantage. And wow, credit to the fans, absolutely. Those obviously inside the stadium, but outside as well, um, for creating that environment. That's not an easy environment to compete. It's getting in international headlines, as we, you know, I'm sure you've shown and the talked third, about already. The so. third period, when after Kyle Connor scored to make it 6-3, the pull your goalie chant, which emanated from the 300 level and took over the building, was a... Uh, Got into your soul. Was it was, <laughs> that was pretty darn good. Shout out to everyone that got that one going up there in the 300s last night. I'm sort of with you because I, I think that if they come back with Gorgiev tomorrow, and, and again, a big part of it is how Ananin is feeling. But I mean, oh, if he's ill right now, it. there's two more games in between game two and game three. If they run it back with Gorgiev and he stinks again, they at least know they come back home with a couple extra days for Ananen to prepare and get ready. And then I think maybe they feel significantly different going into game three, even if they're down to nothing, knowing they've got the other guy in net. If you put Ananen in to your point tomorrow and things don't go well and the Jets win, you're really searching for answers once you get back home in a series that you still would not have lost on home ice, which is what they say is really when the series starts to get real. Well, and if you look at Annan, and I think your point's you know incredibly valid in the sense that how does he feel? I mean, I don't know the guy at all. I don't know what makes him tick, his personality, but you imagine it would take quite a bit to be sitting out of a of a hockey game, a playoff hockey game, right? I mean, this guy would have to have been strapped to the toilet, I imagine, for for him not to be in the lineup, to not even back up, to not even dress, like in a pinch. Because, I mean, you could have done the same thing. You could have said, okay, I mean, people might have questioned why Ananin didn't go in, but if you were never planning to put Arvid home in, regardless of the situation, and clearly that was the case, you know, that you were never planning to put him in, clearly something is up. And to your point about having those extra days, I mean, it's, you know, I think you're already a little bit behind the eight ball if you start talking about what you're, you know, what goaltender you, you need to put in based on, you know, what time frame you have. I mean, I know you're doing that based on health, obviously, but the fact that you would want to play this guy over your starting goaltender and can't, um, that's just a lot of luck for the Winnipeg Jets. But, uh, you know, problem that isn't going to happen, isn't happening in Winnipeg and wouldn't be an issue in Winnipeg if, if Connor Halbuck was to, you know, knock on wood, um, you know, fall ill or whatever, and because Laurent Bressois has been, has been has been stellar and behind him, but that's I mean that's the luxury of of, of having solid goaltending. That's we all know the importance of having that. We all know 
um, whether it's by committee or having your stalwart guy. Uh, and I think it, it, you know, Colorado knew this. I mean, they kind of knew they knew this heading into the trade deadline that need, they needed to address this, and uh, and ultimately didn't. And so that's you know that might end up backfiring them, obviously. But it's just one game, and you know if you look. Look at the, some of the the firepower that the Avalanche were, were showcasing in Game One. Um, I think you're 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 thinking. I don't want to say you're thinking less about your goalie situation, just given what we saw. But if if Ananen is 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 by any stretch of the imagination hurt or still sick, um, you know, I don't. I, I think it's a pretty easy call what you're going to do. Hammer the uh, the matchup between the Lowry line and the McKinnon line is going to be front and center at least in you know, the games in Winnipeg pretty clear that Jared Bednar will look to get away from that matchup. Um, but how about the game from the captain last night? And, and that second goal that, you know, had to go to the review, the fact that he was there just trucking McKinnon, uh, McKinnon in front of the net and McKinnon well, and had no, no opportunity. In before that on the boards. <laughs> I mean, pretty much suplexed him. You know, I, I, I could literally sit here and talk about Adam Lowry's performance and what he means to this team for an hour um, but just your thoughts on the way he, for a second consecutive year, seems to be a guy that is really raising his level of play. And when we talk about leading and leadership, um, right there, doing everything that it takes to win playoff games. And you can count on the defense, maybe not always the offense, but in a game like that, where McKinnon's getting on the board, to have the captain score two of his own, um, pretty clear why he was the guy tabbed as the number one star last night. Just listen to his teammates talk about him, whether it was after you know yesterday's game or, or all season long, or when this team was making the decision on who should be the next captain after after buying out the final year of Blake Wheeler's contract. Uh, you're seeing it on full display right now. I mean, this you know take take the goals out of it, which is which is hard to do considering the guy scored twice. You know, including that that critical four three goal that gave you know end up being the, obviously didn't end up being the winning goal, but put the Jets in a good situation. And, of course, adding that goal later on, I mean, um, that aside, I mean, just the fact that they have the responsibility of, of, you know, and it's not just Adam Lowry. Of course, it's Nito Niederreiter and Mason Appleton too. Um, but shutting down Nathan McKinnon, who you saw yesterday and you've seen all season long, is just, you know, he is a unique player. He is one of, if not the best player in the National Hockey League. Um, that's a tall order to ask. And, not, and, and to add in goals like that, um, incredibly impressive, but to bring the kind of passion, I mean, the comments that I love the most about Adam Lowry, and I think Jets fans love the most about Adam Lowry in general, is that this guy is the ultimate corrector. You know how many times, you know, like, how about Connor Hellebuck talking? He's not a liar. Like, what does that even mean? Like, Helly, like, Helly's like, the like, best. Like, he says know, like, the weird. Like, like, like this, this guy's got an opinion, and it actually matters. Like, you know what I mean? What does that say? That says that this is a guy who, when he speaks, guys listen. And when there's games out there where that's the consistency you need out of your quarterback. And I'll be quite frank. It's a consistency you didn't get from Blake Wheeler. Not saying on the ice. Blake Wheeler always put it out on the ice. Always. I mean, his effectiveness varied. And, and you know, the wheels started to kind of fall off near the end. But he, you could never question Blake Wheeler's give a shit meter when it came to being on the ice. But it's the stuff off the ice. It's the present on presence on the bench. It's the presence in the locker room. It's when guys are down and feeling down and out, they can look over to number 17, and he, he's going to right the ship. He's going to bring everybody back with him. He's going to put everyone on, on his back and bring the morale back up, bring in the true serum when it needs to happen. And the fact of the matter is, you can beat down on a guy only so much as long as you're respected. And Adam Lowry has the complete respect in that entire locker room. And it's not just from the player he is on the ice, which has been an important part of the Jets' success over the last few years and will be a very important part of the Jets' success in whatever they can do in this playoffs. But it's bringing that neutral personality to the locker room with everybody. Because when you come in day in and day out and you act the same and you are the same on and off the ice, people respect you for that. People listen to that. People want to follow you. And Adam Lowry is an absolute leader, and he's showing it in spades this, this not just game one, but this season. This is a guy who knows how special this team is. He knows what, you know, when, when they play the right way, what they can achieve. And he takes his responsibility not only as a leader, but as a shutdown centerman. I mean, you're having GMs across the league talking about how, 
Adam Lowry is the perfect shutdown center in the National Hockey League. That's a testament to his attitude, his consistency, his personality, and his work ethic. And all those things combined have made him the guy that in, in other years where things might have not gone their way and, you know, the mood on the bench or the mood in the locker room might be pretty tense. This is a guy that if he needs to bring the intensity, he will. But he'll do anything he needs to do to get this team going, and he's not afraid to lead by example and show them. Not just tell them what they need to do, but show them what they need to do. And, you know, we could look at different instances in game one yesterday. We can look at various instances throughout this whole season when he's worn the C. We can look at different instances when he wasn't even wearing, you know, a letter in the past. And so this is a guy who's who's just brought a breath of fresh air. He's brought a level of accountability. And I think he's brought a level of competitiveness that I'm not saying didn't exist before, because it certainly did, but it, it is it, it comes on a consistent uh, basis and it's something that is that is contagious and, and you can tell from the comments around from his teammates the play around from his teammates that when that guy's rolling when that guy's working his hardest it's hard not to replicate that and I think we saw that in game one for sure and the emotion man I mean you want that emotion all day long you and need nobody it. brings it better than Adam Lowry does no you, you absolutely need it and it, it seemed like there was that was as emotional and as a fired up team. And they needed to maintain that because of all the ups and downs of the game. Um, listen, I don't think anyone's expecting another 7 6 tilt. Um, tons of hits last night. I mean, for two teams that aren't known as particularly physical, over 100 hits in the game was uh, significant. All the odd man rushes, the chances, the goals. I think one guy didn't get a credit for a hit. Was it Lekkinen on their team? I think only one player. <laughs> Maybe you might. Remo might need to fact check me on that one, but I, for some reason, remember looking at it. And every like, think... every Jet had one, mm -hmm. and for the Avalanche, yes, you are right. Only Lekkinen did not have a hit, so it was physical. But I guess what I was going to ask you is Short, think, how right? different, how different of a game stylistically do you think we will see tomorrow night? The Jets are certainly going to plan for that. Um, but I think as we've seen, Colorado is sort of a different beast when it comes to particularly their big guys when they get going. I mean, is this going to be night and day or is this going to be we'll see how good the Jets are defensively because we know exactly what Colorado is going to do and let's keep on bringing it and putting pucks on Helly. I think you're going to see a different game just by the fact that I don't think the Jets are going to get into the kind of hole that they got into or get into that track meet early on. I think that the nerves of this, of this series have, have come and gone now. I think that excitement will be will be you know whatever change to inspiration or, or determination whatever you want to call it um and i think you're going to see a, a, a you know a, a, a correction if you will because i think in that game sometimes like and you heard rick bonus say after the game you just kind of have to ride the wave with it you know what i mean because i think in like i don't think that rick bonus had a choice it turned into a track meet it, it, it became a back and forth affair and to to get the jets to somehow try to change that style in the game and slow it down if that backfires and the winnipeg jets lose that game because of that i think you lose a bit of the players i'm not saying you lose them like for the series i just think there'd be players being like we were we were competing in this we were doing well let's continue this now i think rick probably addresses the team today says look guys you had your fun we know scoring is important uh our key to success of getting out of this series is not to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with their offensive juggernauts now we still want our best players to be our best players we are going to use you know our our last change to our advantage and we're going to try to create um you know mis mismatches on different lines with lowry's line taking the of course the mckinnon line but i think you're going to see a, a significantly more structured game i mean again i think that you watch through the tape there this is a team that's incredibly fast through the middle of the ice they're incredibly, you know, when they're able to transition, um, there's going to be certainly film over some of the egregious errors that the Jets made at, at both blue lines that ultimately resulted in a lot of that fast attack from Colorado. So I think they're, like I said off the top, I think there's a lot of correctionable stuff that the Winnipeg Jets did. Yes, it was a lot of fun. You went toe-to-toe. -to -toe, you end up on the winning end, end of it. That's great. But back, you know, back to what they were talking about at the beginning of the series, back to that structured play, back to what – what what allowed them to go on the run at the end of the season? What allowed them to finish second in the Central and fight for first in the West? That's the that's the bread and butter that the Jets need to get to. They got to get out of that whole zone of you know we're going to go toe to toe. We're going to be able to outscore Nathan McKinnon. Yeah, that might be possible, but that's not that's the recipe that Colorado is going to want you to do. If you if you bore them to death, 
If you play structured hockey, I think the Winnipeg Jets could not just beat the Avalanche. I think they could dominate them. And I think what Rick Bonus has to hit at his disposal is, yes, he's got this 7-6 roller coaster in game one, but he's got three other examples where the Winnipeg Jets played a, played a more structured game, particularly that 7 nothing game. Um, and that is going to be the key to their success. So I think we're going to see a different style for sure. We're going to see an attempt at a different style. Um, but like, you know, that wasn't the game plan in game one. So I'm not ruling out another roller coaster. And, and certainly for, uh, you know, for the enjoyment levels and the national and international attention for the series, that would go a long way. But I imagine the Jets are doing everything in their power to temper that, that chaos that, uh, that we saw through the first 60 minutes of game one. Hammer, uh, great stuff as always. Um, <laughs> that that is one that we'll remember for a long time. But it's on to the next one tomorrow, late night, eight thirty start, Canada Life Center game two, and then two days off before the series resumes in Denver on Friday night. Um, great to have you on as always, buddy. Have a good one and enjoy the game tomorrow night. Always a pleasure, my friend. That is eight thirty start is unkind to the locals, I think. But I mean, Colorado has to deal with the two. Uh, it will be interesting to see how that factors into the game, but I'm, you know, like I said, I'm expecting a hard-fought game by the uh, by the Jets, and uh, hopefully for the fans, a, a two-nothing lead heading into uh, Mile High City in a few days. Yeah, well, it's funny. I mean, the, you know, from a from the fan perspective of it, like I have no doubt that the fans are going to be off the chain, like right from the get-go at the beginning of the game. Uh, that extra couple hours of pre-gaming probably will lead to a very loud building. Um, the key is for the team to be able to play at a level that keeps that energy going because, as we mentioned, that is going to be real late for folks when we get into the third period. Uh, but if it's anything like last night, I don't think people have any problem maintaining their engagement to uh, what they was it. They won't need seven goals to get out of their seats. They just <laughs> need to see a strong effort by the Winnipeg Jets, and that'll be enough, I think. Exactly. Have a great one, man. Thanks again. You too. Take care, Haas. See you next there week. There is uh, Jeff Hamilton. You know, we're going to hear from uh, Brandon Dillon and Gabe Velarde in just a minute. And Jason Demers is coming up in just a minute. I did want to remind folks or let them know that it's not too late to get, and I, you know, this is just one game. Round two is certainly by no means um, imminent or guaranteed. Lots of work left. But if you have been thinking, about getting a package and becoming a member next year for the Winnipeg Jets. It's not too late to get priority access to playoff tickets for round two. The Jets have extended the period of putting down a deposit for a 24-25 season ticket membership, and you'll get priority access to 2024 round two playoff tickets as well. Find out more. Check out everything the Jets have going on for next year at winnipegjets.com slash memberships. We've got to give a shout out to our friends and the great support we get from Princess Auto. Saw the new turf going down at Princess Auto Stadium today for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers upcoming season. Of course, Princess Auto proudly founded and headquartered right here in Winnipeg and proudly supporting the Bombers, Jets, Gold Eyes, and of course, Winnipeg Sports Talk. Princess Auto is also the place where you'll find the best deals on the most unique assortment of tools and equipment around everything you need to complete the projects on your list or start something new is at Princess Auto. Pop by and see them, Panet Road, Portage Avenue West, and you can always shop online 24-7, 365 at princessauto.com. Cheers to our friends at Canadian Club. Saw our pal James from CC yesterday at the game, heading in, all ready to go. Uh, did get a chance to talk to James quickly about the upcoming Bombers season. Of course, CC is the official spirit of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Looking forward to uh, those CC and Gingers and uh, meeting all of you in and around the Rum Hut in the North End this year. And of course, right now, toasting Jet wins is a perfect use for Canadian Club, Canada's oldest and most famous Canadian whiskey. Pick it up with all the Canadian Club family of products at your local Manitoba Liquor Marts. Um, folks, let us know where you uh, where you were at for the game last night. We did a fun little roll call on Twitter yesterday, and man, Jet fans all around the world replying to that one. If you are, of course, in Winnipeg and you're not at the game on Tuesday, we've got the road games on Friday and Sunday. Boston Pizza is the place for fans to team up for the Cup for playoffs. Whiteout playoff parties happening at every local Boston Pizza. 
including their new playoff menu, which includes wing flights, the new Sicilian square footer pizza, and the jalapeno popper a popper dip, whiteout shots, beer specials as well, pick a player contests. They're giving away P1 lower bowl tickets for every home game. And they're also giving away a grand prize trip for two to the Stanley Cup final. So get your whitest, your brightest, and bring your crew to watch the playoffs at Boston Pizza. And getting those whites, Royal Sports was in Sano on the weekend. Popped by there on Saturday. Jet fans getting their whiteout gear. And Royal has such an amazing selection right now. They've got all the playoff shirts, hoodies, t-shirts, and more. White overalls as well. The fan chains. Uh, if you need to get ready for the game tomorrow night, if you're in attendance or going to BP, getting together with friends, the best and whitest all at Royal Sports, jerseys and more, 750 Pemina Highway, at Royal Sports Pemina on Instagram for the latest merchandise drops and sale information. And, of course, don't forget soccer, baseball, softball, tennis, running, bikes, all coming in right now just in time for spring as well. All right, Jason Demers is coming up in a couple minutes. But I did want to get back to the Jets. And, you know, Gabriel Velarde had a chance to play his first time as a Winnipeg Jet in front of the whiteout. Gabe's 1-0. Uh, here's what he had to say about last night's game. I think definitely we know we can play better. Um, I think we got the best goalie in the world. Um, they played well. So uh, credit to them. And uh, I think... Uh, I mean, I was nervous at the start. I think we played kind of nervous. Um, but, uh, hey, we got the win. Good teams find a way to win. Well, they uh, they got that win last night, and uh, the whiteout in the crowd was a big part of it as well. Certainly a big part of the story. Here's what uh, Velarde had to say about uh, his first time playing in the playoffs in front of the home crew in the peg. Yeah, I mean, it was fun. It was fun. Okay. That was a great atmosphere. That's what hockey's about. It was an awesome game to be a part of. It was really fast and obviously you know everyone got to watch that first period where you know six goals that's it's exciting stuff yeah i wonder gabe as as a new guy who hadn't played in a whiteout in winnipeg before it's kind of maybe everything you could have imagined and then some yeah for sure obviously it's nice that we won so uh great atmosphere and uh i'm looking forward to some more, some more games here good stuff and uh, here's one more from velarde I just talked about the power play. Certainly the Avs power play was clicking two for two. That'll be something the Winnipeg Jets will want to take care of next time. But here's a learning on the Jets power play. Uh, power play. What do we get? What do we go? I don't know. What do we go? One for three? For two. One for sure. One for two? I think yeah. I mean, the percentage isn't bad. I think we had some chances. Um, yeah, I think we had some good chances. Even uh, the other unit had some good chances on that uh, power play in the second. or And... Uh, yeah, we scored there with KC. Yeah, that's right. So it's good. Hey, you got to score on the power play. Their, their power play went two for two, right? So we got to uh, make sure uh, that uh, when you get those opportunities, you got to capitalize. All right, there's Gabe Velarde. Uh, Tyler Toffoli spoke this morning. We'll have a little bit of that for you later on. But uh, this is going to be awesome. Let's welcome in longtime NHL defenseman now working with the NHL Network, Jason Demers to Winnipeg Sports Talk. Jason, what's up? It's great to have you on the show. Thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. It's uh, thank you for having me as well. It's been uh, we finally got it together. It took us it took us enough time, but we finally made it. Well, I'll tell you what, perfect time to have you on after. Uh, I mean, right? I mean, uh, listen, I, I most of us here in the chat, for those of us that were at the game in the stands, still kind of collecting our breath from what was an absolute white knuckle ride for sixty minutes. I mean, how did you see that Jets Avs game last night in Game One? It gave me shades of my men's league hockey. Uh, on Monday nights, but uh, it was a crazy game. It just was back and forth. I feel like Winnipeg got caught up in that Colorado style of play a little bit and and at times kind of got back to their game and then they started dominating and then they'd kind of fall asleep a little bit and a couple of just turnovers that are uncharacteristic by them and obviously Hellybuck just didn't have a Hellybuck game and, and I don't foresee him having another game like that in this series though. You know, uh, as a former player that's been in these series before, take yourself to the Avalanche locker room. I mean, this is the team that was 0-3 against the Jets this year. They just lost to them 7-0 at home last week in what was the biggest game of the year to really decide a home ice. 
and then you get six and lose game number one. I mean, uh, what, what what what's that like at practice and around the club today, losing the way they did last night, considering the way they came into the postseason? It's disheartening, I'm sure. You know, obviously they have a good pedigree there, though. So I don't think, you know, guys will kind of be like, listen, we can get to hell, you buck. So we just need to shore up defensively. And, and I kind of talked about that a little bit on, on Twitter. And when I watched that game, I'm like, Colorado just has to kind of decide if, if they play a little bit tighter defensively, they can make this a series because they, they got to protect your give. I don't think his confidence is anywhere near a good spot right now. And it's just not going to be good for them. And it's going to be over quickly if they continue playing this way. So listen, they, they, they held the play for most parts of the game. I'd say they probably took it to Winnipeg, but you know, the way Winnipeg plays, it always sometimes looks like they're getting dominated, but they play within that structure and they counterpunched a little bit, but the chances they were giving up to Winnipeg were just great A's in the high, in the middle of the slot, backdoor tap-ins. It's just, it's not conducive to the, to the style that Georgiev plays and, and where, where his confidence is right now. Because what I was telling people is you're not going to get a hell you buck game like that again. Like he's not going to give up six again. I don't think he's going to at least one of these games, a series, he's going to pitch a shutout or he's going to give up one goal only. So if I'm Colorado, it's like that was a big opportunity to steal game one. And now you might not get another opportunity to score six. So you have to shore up defensively if that's the case for sure. You know, the, it, we've talked a lot about the goaltending matchup for obvious reasons. Um, the matchup between, on home ice, Adam Lowry's line with Nate McKinnon, it, probably we won't see as much of it. Bednar traditionally has gone up against the Shifley line when Nate McKinnon's out on home ice. But for Nate to get his, a goal and an assist last night, dangerous all night, how big is it for a team perspective to have a guy like Adam Lowry step up and not only do what he does to minimize as best as you can against the top player, but score two of his own in the fashion that he did last night? I know, and two, uh, I would call them scorer's goals a little bit, you know, taking a two-on-one and then taking it to the net. I thought that line played fantastic for what it was up against. And anytime you can net even against that line, it's a win because you got to assume that your your Shifley line is going to outscore its opponents. And and I even the 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 Nemestikov line I thought was fantastic as well last night. So I I think it was a great great showing by them uh, to get two against that line is big because anytime you can score against them, it it, it means you're not getting scored on. So I thought they did a fantastic job five on five. They made it hard. They made it a little ugly for them. Obviously, you can't not give up something to Nate. He's just so incredible. He's going to find a hole eventually and, and get an opportunity to score. So, But I thought they minimized those, and and I thought it wasn't their best game either. I think they have another level they can get to, so I think they're going to probably address some of the defensive stuff, Winnipeg, and, and adjust. Jason Demers with us on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Jason, stepping away from Jets' as for a minute. Um, what did you think of Vancouver returning to the playoffs last night? Another great atmosphere in a Canadian market. Incredible. Um, and a big comeback win. Uh, I mean, we knew that the Nashville Predators were going to be a really tough out for whoever they played. I mean, you've yeah. got a world-class defenseman in Yossi, an excellent goaltender in Soros, and a team that, uh, to be honest, really seems like greater than the sum of its parts. Uh, Vancouver down in the third period battles back wins it um just thoughts on that game overall and what a win in that fashion does for vancouver returning to the postseason is thatcher demko good or is he good because he kept them in it when they needed it i thought i thought it was a pretty even game and it's what i expected from this series i you know i think vancouver is going to get its sea legs a little bit and i do think they're you know they're they did finish in a great spot you know they finished first in the pacific but i don't think they're the top team to beat in the West. So I, I, I do believe it's going to be a tough out, but I was saying before the playoffs that I think Nashville is the best team for them to get to start the playoffs. Just a team that kind of plays a little run and gun and, and tries to get up the ice quick. And, and with that defensive structure that talk it's implemented in Vancouver, it allowed them to kind of counter punch a little bit and get some opportunities. So I think it's just a good setup. I, I thought they needed that game one. I think this, it, the more I watch that game last night, I think it's going to be a long series. I think it's going to be back and forth. I wouldn't be surprised if Nashville steals one in Vancouver. But 
I could see Vancouver still in, 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 in Nashville. So I just think it's going to be how far Saros can take him. And conversely, you know, Thatcher Demko is just absolutely incredible. He's not missing, didn't miss one step. I mean, that save he made on uh, Novak in the first. I think it was Novak. Uh, no, it was on Beauvillier. It was absolutely incredible and just set the tone for that game for them. Um, Jason, tonight we get Dallas Vegas. I, I mean, here in the center, we've talked about this kind of becoming the group of death after Vegas blew it to the Ducks last week. And now yeah. Dallas's reward for being the number one team in the West, the defending champion Vegas Golden Knights, who miraculously are getting a number of players back <laughs> just in time for the uh, for the playoffs. Um, yeah. Feel it like what's your take on this matchup? What will be the key to winning for these clubs? And um, you know, when they drop the puck tonight, what are you expecting from uh, Dallas in particular at home after this season? But the Vegas Golden Knights, who haven't had this group together play really at all for the last little while, but obviously have a pretty good playoff record and resume heading into tonight. Yeah, it's you listen, you're gonna have to go through Vegas. We all knew, we all pretended that we didn't know that Stone and, and everybody would be back game one. We all knew it. And until the CBA is addressed, it's going to be that way. So people just got to, you know, just, just, you know, we got to drink our drink, whatever, as bad as it tastes, it is what it is. I think Dallas is probably well suited to take it to them. They're a young team. You know, they got that youth that is incredible. They got some good veterans throughout that lineup that are playing top notch hockey. And obviously they got the otter and, and, and and back there to kind of shore everything up. I thought they did a great job picking up Tanev at the deadline. So it's a well match. You know, this is probably, and to your point, you hit it on the head. It is the death group with Vegas, Colorado, Winnipeg, and uh, Dallas here. This is going to be, these four teams are the four potential cup winners. It, it's going to be a who's who. It's going to be a gauntlet. Uh, I think Vegas, the big question marks goaltending. I think everything else will be fine. They're super deep now with Stone in and, and the pickups they made. But I just think it's going to be – I think I saw Logan Thompson's the starter. Uh, so we'll see if it sticks to Stomp Thompson or goes to Hill. And, and that's their big question mark right now. So if they can be good in nets, I think it's they're going to be a damn tough out. And with Stone's 70% of what he was. He's a hell of a player. He's shown he can do it, come back with no rust. And I mean, it's a scary, it's a scary, scary <laughs> roster. But if there's a team that's built for it, I mean, I think Dallas right now is peaking at the right time. They're playing some fantastic hockey, and it's going to be that. That is going to be one hell of a series. So it's going to be interesting to see. Yeah, I, I, listen, cannot wait for that one tonight. And of course, our friends in Edmonton getting ready to fire it up um, again against the Kings in the first round. I think they were sort of preparing for Vegas. It looked like it was going to be Vegas. Now it's L.A., a team that they've handled, although very lengthy series the last couple of years. Um, Edmonton more positioned this year for a long playoff run in your mind? I think so. I, I, I think they have to be. You know, this has to be their mindset. There's no – you got Leon coming up soon. His contract's running out. you gotta, you got to take your shot. It's now, so the next two years. And obviously I think the, kill, the Kings are – a frustrating team to play against and they got a lot of depth as well but i think they have the edge in goaltending if ever so slightly and i think up front with that forward depth i think they'll be able to outlast them i think it's going to be a tough series the the three series were in this first round where i was kind of i think you could go either way is the this king series the canuck series and the bruins maple leafs i think it's a coin flip i do think edmonton has the edge and they should win but you know, it's it, you got to give the X factors the Edmonton media versus the LA Kings media a lot less pressure in that Kings locker room, and that always plays a factor. And, and then obviously the goaltending battle. How well does the goaltending stand up on either side? Because both goalies have shown they can be, they can shoot the lights out, and also they can let in a lot. So it's it's going to be how does either team handle those little little swings in a series well you mentioned i mean the media the spotlight in canadian market is just inherently different yep but there's also a huge amount of pressure on this group i i mean huge. you got Connor mcdavid the best player on the planet leon dreisaitl was a top five guy in most people's opinion or certainly top 10 like it's kind of now or never for this group to get it done and they've had some 
some tough losses in the past, but I mean, you're right. Not only is the spotlight there, but the expectations from that fan base legitimately as high as they've probably ever been. But if they don't get it done, big questions. And with that comes a lot on the shoulders of those top players. Yeah, they're gonna. There's gonna be. It's a no excuses kind of year for Edmonton. I think if they fall short, it's gonna fall squarely. You know, I feel like the top guys have performed enough and gotten out of those those disappointments. But if it happens this year, I think it's gonna be firmly on the the shoulders of them. So they know that. And I mean, I think they're ready to go in that locker room. They're they got some depth. They got some youth. I think on the back end, they're they're better off than people think. And I think Skinner's shown flashes this year and, and a good chunks is, and stretches of phenomenal play. So he's a gamer. I didn't like how they handled him at the end of the year, but I think he they come out and win this game tonight. Uh, it, I think it'll be a tight one, but I think they win tonight. Yeah, yeah, throwing them out against the abs in that last oh, game with none of their ridiculous. none of their players. It was, <laughs> uh, that was a bit of a, a head scratcher. Hey, you yeah. mentioned Boston, uh, Toronto. What was your takeaway from game one, and um, how do you feel about the Leafs' situation heading into the Garden again tonight to try to even the series? Uh, they need it. That's for sure they need it. Uh, it's an, it, This is another coin flip series. I think Boston just frustrated them. They played their system. I think the, their D, the decor on Toronto couldn't break the puck out to save their lives, and they're going to have to figure that out. There might need to be some adjustments, and forwards might need to come a little bit lower and and they might need to simplify against this Boston team because it was just turnover after turnover and they just kind of fueled that Edmonton uh, sorry that that Boston transition and the best players just need to be their best players to get back on track I think if I'm, I was hearing Willie Nylander's back tonight and if he or it's like on the fence and if he's back I mean it's I think they take game two here and they might split but I wouldn't be surprised if if Swayman or Olmark. That's like, you know, for Boston, it's how, you know, and that's the big, it's not really a controversy. They've been doing this all year and they said they're going to stick to the one goalie, one goalie. But I, you know, Swayman's record against Toronto is so incredibly good. Do you really give the net to Olmark? But it looks like they're going to and, and this could maybe hurt them, but it could also just be a, a new way to, to coach a team and, and coach goaltenders in the playoffs. <laughs> well, I mean, hey, good problems to have and great choices to have. Yeah. Um, and, hey, you know, we talk about the pressure on the guys like McDavid and Dreisel and Edmonton. I mean, the pressure on these guys with the Leafs. I mean, the core four, the guys have been making all this money. They've won one yeah. playoff series. They finally got over the hump last year and then quickly were dismissed by the uh, Florida Panthers. Like, it's not like they're not going up against tough teams. They're not even favored in the series but another playoff failure is going to uh, mean for a long off season. And that's a level of pressure in and around Toronto. We jokingly refer to it as the center of the universe. It comes with a lot. And it's all like Mitch Marner needs to show up for this game tonight and do something. I mean, if not, well, you've played in the league before. I can't imagine what that type of scrutiny and pressure would be, especially when things aren't going well at this time of the year. Yeah. Well, you talk about a, uh not a win now for them because I think uh, Trevelings came in and I think he sees that this isn't really a team built for a Stanley cup run, but they need to see what they have within that core. And if that core can carry them. And I think the perfect matchup for them was Boston, a team that's beat up on them for this past year and in past series. So they need to get out of this round to show people that, it's this isn't going to be forever, and I think if they don't, it's going to be anarchy for at least one person within that core four that's getting booted out of there. And but you know, I think people in Toronto know that. Listen, this isn't you're not going to go to the Stanley Cup Finals with this team. I'm sorry, you know, there's some great players on that team, but they don't have a shot. There's too much in the East in terms of they got to get through Florida or Tampa next, and then they got to get through New York or Carolina. Uh, they're not making it out of there. Uh, I think it's just a good measuring stick here to see what they have in terms of depth. And then also if these top guys can come out and maybe carry them through around because, you know, in nets, there's too many question marks in nets, you know, Sam Sonoff's been good coming back from, from his mental health break. And I thought he's played phenomenally, but he's not a guy that's going to drag you into the final. So it's going to come down to your point. You know, the Marners, the Matthews, the Nylanders and Johnny Tavares needs to 
you know, wear that C and show us what he could do because uh, otherwise, if they get bounced out of this round, I think they this is a series they can win. So if they don't win, I think it's some serious questions need to be asked, even at the coaching uh, area. So I think it will be, and this is definitely a feeling out process, I think, for, for Tree Lake. Jason, this has been awesome, man. I can't thank you enough for jumping on. Um, thank hey, you I for just wanted me. to ask you before we go, did you cross paths with Brendan Dillon during your uh, time with the Sharks? I did. We uh, we got traded for each other. That's that's right. You guys like basically yeah. said hi in the airport as you went back, like one going Girl, to well, Dallas and one. We had mutual friends a little bit, and, and we like ended up, I think that summer we went for like dinner, and uh, we went for dinner or lunch in Dallas and we kind of kept in touch and you know I root for him he's a great guy super nice human had a phenomenal game last game I watched him and that was the best deep pair I think last night uh I think if Winnipeg needs a run they need Sandberg and Stanley to be a lot better in that bottom six but I think he was I thought the top four did as, as well as they could against that offensive juggernaut of a team but no I it, it it's funny we we had like filmed the holiday sweater thing on YouTube. People can go look at it. It's like, it's, <laughs> that's a classic. Yeah. And I had filmed it and I got traded like two days later and then <laughs> I get traded. So you think you do a holiday sweater video and you think that's going to be what keeps you in the city. I'm like, well, I can't get traded. I, I just did a big, I just did a big, you know, great little teaser for the team for the holidays. And we, I think they filmed, Dylan at the end he did like a little cameo so it was pretty funny he they like aired it and it was me so they aired it like I think a week later when Dylan was playing and I was traded in Dallas and then they had Dylan as a cameo being like oh did I you know did I miss the song something like that yeah there you go that's funny uh it's just such a great video it's timeless and uh yeah it led to me getting traded two days later which is funny for Dylan which is uh, just this is an so all funny. time all time classic video. I remember I had no idea who Matt Nieto was before watching before this. That. He 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 really he really stood out in this uh, in this production, but uh, the entire crew um pretty fun and yes, I'm not sure whether it was because of your performance that led you to being traded, uh but you certainly left a mark on San Jose with this. Uh, I was I would say I was pretty dialed in during that song. And I think I think I was maybe number two behind Nieto. I mean, the funny thing with Matt Nieto is he's like a he was like a rapper on the side. And he did like he had like a couple songs he did that he played for the team. And this is like his rookie year, I think, his rookie or second year. And it was just so funny because this kind of spawned out of this. Like he they found out he sang and then all everybody came in together. I mean Tomash Hurdles there, Parkley Goudreau's there. It's just hilarious the guys that are that are in that video that are still you know still playing and the guys that aren't playing anymore. So there I am. Look at that. <laughs> I mean, it was a lot of fun. It was in the moment we didn't know how big it would actually turn into, and and every year it they, it comes out. So there's Chris Tierney. It's hilarious. Uh, we had it was a, lot, a lot of fun to film. We had Niato on uh, the warm up back on the our TSN days and. Uh, we immediately went and started talking about this, and I think yeah, it basically yeah. dominated most of the uh, most of the uh, the rest of the conversation. Yeah. I'm just quickly on Brendan Dillon, though. I mean, you know what a career he's uh, he's turned out Amazing. in, and I mean, this is a guy, you know, that came here to Winnipeg and is is really supplying the Jets with so many. Like, there's a lot of veteran leadership, but I mean, his size, his physicality, it's important in the regular season. But I mean, Jason, I'm sure you could speak to how even more important it is right now with the grind and the challenge of the Stanley cup playoffs to have a big horse like that, able to eat up some big minutes on your blue line. And not just that, like he wants to be there. Like I, I messaged with him last year a little bit cause I was, you know, attempting to get a PTO anywhere and, and I want to jets was the team I had circled. So I was kind of messaging with him to, to see if there's any room. And, and we just talked about the team a little bit and, and he was just, you know, beams about the city and the team and, and wants to win there and, and loves it. His wife loves it there. And so it was pretty cool to kind of hear that from him. And, and it just shows, you know, he's been a great leader for that team and provides him with, you know, his best offensive year he's had, I'm pretty sure in the league, at least most goals he's ever had in his career. And he just provides physicality. He's 
eats up minutes, tough minutes, plays great on the PK, and just he's just a guy who sticks up for his teammates. So you know, I think I think Dallas won that trade when they traded me for him. But you know, he's he's uh, he's proven to to really have had a great career and landed in a spot that that loves his style of game and and also he fits in perfect with that city and that team. Speaking of landing in a spot and fitting in perfect, uh, tell uh, our uh, listeners and viewers about uh, what you've got cooking on over at NHL Network and how that's going. Yeah, it's been it's a different transition. I never thought it would kind of move along this quickly, and it, it was pretty seamless for me. I, I just kind of reached out, and they asked me to come on with the NHL Network, and it started with a, a tryout run on an NHL Tonight in the middle of the summer, and they ended up asking me if, I wanted to do some more days and I started doing that and then ended up signing a contract with them. So I was, uh, it's been very, it's a very different muscle. Uh, I, you really have to watch a lot more hockey than I ever watched when I played. I mean, I never used to watch hockey this much and, and uh, I always just tried to mentally get away. Uh, but it's been great to kind of sit back and support a lot of guys that I like. There's days that it's tough because you obviously want to play, but, uh, overall, it's been a, it's been a great transition for me, and and they've allowed me the kind of freedom to stay stay within the game, and and also lend my uh, vast and I don't even know what I'd call it, but just a very very vast knowledge of hockey that I have, and and again, people got to listen to me, so it's great. It's my favorite thing. I just get to impart all my wisdom on people. Well, I'll tell you what, we're here for that wisdom anytime. This was great having you on for the first time. Uh, all the best, and there's no, I can't imagine a better time of year to be working NHL Network than the first round of the Stanley Cup playoffs, but uh, hopefully we can do this again sometime. I really appreciate it, and uh, keep your eyes up for that whiteout tomorrow night here in the peg. I think it's going to be go silly. Peg. I know. I'm really Late fun. night, 8.30 game. That'll be a Ooh. well-lubricated crowd. Hey, just that quickly will. on that, like as a player, when you say, oh, the game time is 8.30 or 8.45, um, does that change really anything that you do, or uh, is it just um, deal with it like everyone else yeah, has every, to? Yeah, everything just gets moved up an hour. You know, everything gets moved up an hour and a half, so if your nap's at 12, it's really at 1, 1.30, and if your pregame meal's at 3, it's really at 5 or 6, and uh, uh not five or six, I'm sorry, but like four. And then if you're, you know, waking up, you try to get to bed at the right time. You might still wake up at the same time and, and your nap might just be a little bit longer. But I think it's guys are pretty professional and they know what to do and, and know how to get ready. It's a couple extra coffees as well. doesn't hurt. And maybe a Red Bull for the the guy who's feeling a little frisky. So, but I think it's, it's the hardest part about those games is afterwards. It's getting to sleep at a reasonable hour. I think... Luckily, there's no back-to-backs for these guys, but you know, having to play that game two at 8:30 and then travel the next day is is tough on the body. So I think it's it's going to be uh, it's a it's a huge. I think it's a it's a must-win for obviously every team. Every game in the playoffs is a must-win, but Winnipeg needs to come out of here two and zero because Colorado is a beast at home, and and especially with that travel is going to be tough staying in a hotel after playing an 830 game. You want to be going into game three with a two, nothing lead on the boys. Yeah, that's the, uh, that is the plan up uh, JD. Yeah. Thanks so much for doing this. Let's uh, catch up again. Uh, we'll uh, be it. watching you do your thing on NHL network and uh, enjoy the playoffs. Thanks. And uh, hopefully we can do this again later on. All right. I appreciate it, Andrew. Thank you. Good Go stop. Back. There is right. Jason Demers now with NHL network. Fun, fun conversation. And some great insight from a guy that played for a long time. And, hey, he played with the Stars. He knows what it's like in these Central Division streets in the first round of the playoffs. They tell you when to play after the Leafs or whatever's happening in the East, and it inevitably ends up with some late starts. We got one tomorrow. Uh, and as I said, just have to deal with it, and uh, hopefully the Jets will be ready for that as well. Um, listen, we're going to hear uh, quickly from Tyler Toffoli um, coming up in just a second, but I do want to get to a quick Breezy Bend golf report for our friends over at Breezy Bend Country Club. Morning finish today at the RBC Heritage. Tell me if you've heard this before. Scotty Scheffler won again on the PGA Tour. First guy since 85 to go back-to-back -back with the Masters green jacket and the plaid jacket from the RBC Heritage. Scheffler finished at 19 under, three shots ahead of Sahith Thagala. 
and four ahead of Wyndham Clark and Pat Cantley. Top Canadians uh, were Mac Hughes at 39th, Adam Hadwin 42nd, Corey Connors 44th. And actually, Corey Connors and uh, Taylor Pendrith teaming up this week at the Zurich Classic. Big shout out to our friends at Breezy. There will be teams hitting the golf course soon. Hopefully that does not include the Winnipeg Jets. Um, the Jets can wait for their tee times. We'll be getting ours very soon. If you want more information on Breezy Bend, both membership as well as booking things like weddings at their beautiful facility, go online to breezybend.ca. All right, we've got more from the Jets. Tyler Toffoli spoke earlier today um, after uh, from the arena Here's uh, what DeFoley had to say about the mood around the team today after that uh, crazy 7-6 win. We won the first game, but it doesn't feel like we're satisfied. We know we didn't play the best, and, and we have a lot better to give, and I think that's something that is good within our group. We know that we can keep getting better, and um, obviously it's only been one game, but we got to move forward, and um, keep looking at the things that we need to do better and, and what we can change and, and just go out there and execute. All right, there's Tyler Toffoli. And, uh, of course, Toffoli, he's played in a bunch of Canadian markets in the playoffs, but this was his first time in the Winnipeg whiteout. Here's what he had to say about uh, the atmosphere of last night's tilt. You could tell that they're, you know, they're super involved the entire night. And, uh, like I said, it was just a great experience and, uh, with the planes flying over, I thought I didn't think it was actually a real thing. I thought it was just like the video, you know. So um, that was that was that was sweet. So um, hopefully we can, you know, keep the energy up and you know get a couple more wins for everyone. All right. So there's Tyler Toffoli speaking on uh, last night's game. Um, here's a little bit of Brendan Dillon as well, who had a monster game and is going to be leaned on big time by Rick Bonus as he has been all season long. Here's what Brendan Dillon had to say about last night's win. <laughs> what a hockey game, huh? Entertainment. We were riding the same roller coaster. Everybody else was there. Crazy. How do you put a finger on just how that developed? Because you guys have been such a good defensive team this year. Did you just get caught up in something? Or? I mean, we. I guess we proved we can score. We can score goals too, but. Yeah, man, oh man, that's just not. That's not us. I mean, we. We, we got to be way better here in, in, in game two. I mean. Tip our cap to us. I mean, you know, a Stanley Cup playoff win is a Stanley Cup playoff win. Um, we'll take it for sure. But um, you know, credit them. They played really well. I think we were, uh, you know, we were solid for for most of the game. Um, you know, obviously capitalized on our chances, and I think we saw our forecheck and when we were able to get pucks in. Um, you know, they've got so much talent and skill. Um, when they have to play in their own zone, that's that's where we want to try and keep them. Good stuff with Brendan Dillon post game last night. Here's a little bit more from Dillon on just what it was like to play in that game. Yeah, I mean that's the thing about playoffs, and I think for our group, we've we've got a lot of guys that have played playoff games to be able to understand that you, you win one game and you feel like you can win the Stanley Cup, you know, and then you you lose one game and sometimes you feel like like it's over. And I think it's managing that stuff. Um, you know, everything that just happened here over the past 60 minutes is done. Um, we got a huge win for our group. Um, you know, we're obviously going to watch and talk about some things tomorrow and um, just got to come on and be better in game two. And one more from Brandon Dillon on uh, just the opponent, the Colorado Avalanche, and how dangerous that squad can be. I mean, they're, they're a team that basically all season has been, been talked about as a Stanley Cup favorite, right? They've got one of the best players in the world, a bunch of superstars. Um, you know, they're, they're a good team, credit them, but... Uh, we're, we're confident in the depth we've gotten here. We're confident in the way that we can defend. Um, you know, I think for us, we uh, we know we can be a lot better in, in certain areas. But um, you know, at the end of the day, we're, we're happy to get the win. Right, Brendan Dillon of the Winnipeg Jets on the Avs. And uh, speaking of the Avs, Remo, we have an uh, update on what's going on around the visitors uh, today heading into tomorrow night? Yeah, we're all waiting to hear, okay, what's going on with the goaltending? You know, they did have some injuries as well. Sam Girard was, uh, he was out, and we know Jonathan Drouin's out for the series. But here's John Liu from TSN tweeting out just a couple minutes ago. Uh, Avalanche coach Jared Bednar says goalie Justice Ananen is still sick. Sam Berard, Sam Gerard took part in today's optional skate and his TBD 
for game two. On Georgiev, Bednar says his starter has to reset and play better than he did in game one. So Jared Bednar making, saying, I mean, what else can you really say uh, yeah. there? But it game sounds like seven. it sounds like they don't have um, much of a secondary option. So uh, we'll have to keep in touch. Like, I don't know what illness and it has what Jeff said he was been on the toilet the whole time. Is that is that what he said? I don't know. So um, I didn't hear. Yeah, I thought Jeff said something like that, but we're, I'm not sure. We don't know what it is. Anyways, he was not playing. But as far as the Jets, John Liu also tweeting a lot of people asking about this. Uh, Rick Bonus said today, not considering any lineup changes for Game 2. Morgan Barron hasn't resumed skating, so he's another week away from being available. So the Avs... You know, we'll watch to see about Sam Gerrard and the goalie situation. And the Jets are just going to, I guess, the winning lineup uh, moves forward and plays again. Well, for sure. And listen, the fourth line last night, including David Gustafson, was uh, was really good. Mm -hmm. uh, and, of course, I have followed me that huge play to set up uh, that slapper right from the slot by Nemetsnikov and got them on the board. And Rick Bonus was not afraid to play those guys as well. Uh, they went out for the first shift after Colorado had scored at least once yesterday um, and certainly acquitted themselves well. So uh, no surprise that that won't be. Yeah, is Steph B exactly? Yeah, I know there was a Gior Georgiev or Georgiev, but I think fans, we can just basically shorten this to Georgie. Uh, the Georgie chant, I hope, will be echoing through the whiteout tomorrow night. Um like Bedner said, he definitely has to reset and be better. You know Connor Hellebuck is going to be better. What the uh, and, and I mean the opportunity. We kind of got into this if you tuned us a little later on with um we got into this with Hammer. Um, you know, Georgiev gets his opportunity to try to redeem himself. And uh if it doesn't work, they hope that Justus Ananen will be ready to go after a couple more days off before Friday's game number three. Um, let's uh, get to the cool bet lines because we've got a very busy, busy night in the National Hockey League. There's nothing like the first couple of weeks of the playoffs where we've got four games pretty much every night. The Leafs are in Boston to take on the Bruins. Um, this line has moved toward the Bruins all day. Minus 143 for Boston, plus 121 for Toronto. Uh, the Canes are minus 242 favorites at home against the New York Islanders, who are plus 200 on the road. And the Stars and the Vegas Golden Knights drop the puck at 830, much like our start time tomorrow. Dallas minus 137 favorites. Vegas plus 117. And then it's out west to Edmonton, 9 p.m. start. Oilers minus 170. Kings plus 144. Uh, looks like the odds are out for tomorrow's Jets Avs game, and it is a pick 'em. Minus 108 on uh, on either side. Now we don't have an updated line for the Jets Avalanche series. Uh, series price on Dallas Vegas, which is starting tonight. Dallas minus 137, Vegas plus 115, and the other series beginning tonight is the Oilers, who are minus 222. And the LA Kings plus 180. Um, you know, I want to do a why not question of the day while we're getting to this for not Autocorp, but Waverly and McGilvery. Uh, very interested as to who people are pulling for and want to see win Dallas or Vegas in the first round. Um, the winner of Colorado, <laughs> the winner of Colorado and Winnipeg will play that series. To me, it's sort of six of one, half a dozen of the other. But let us know for the why not question of the day. Who you got, Dallas or Vegas? Do you have a take on that, Remus? Well, I, I, a lot of takes on Vegas right now. People are not happy with them. And um, Frank Cervalli said on his show today, uh, I think the NHL has a serious competitive integrity issue with Mark Stone coming back to play. And Jason touched on this in your conversation. There's really nothing you can do but... Uh, here's Frank even coming off the top row pass. Look at this tweet. Uh, this is just kind of during our show. This is your number one or one of your top hockey insiders. Precision timing that would make Rolex jealous. I don't know if he's get, trying to get a Rolex. A Rolex. <laughs> <Basically> done, Frank. <laughs> what is a Rolex endorsement? But here's Cap Friendly tweeting out Mark Stone's transactions. What a coincidence 
that he gets put on LTIR around February and then comes back for game one of the playoffs. So a lot of people really upset with Vegas, and I put out the poll uh, already almost 100 votes in. Who do you want to win? 75% saying Dallas. Even if, like, I think even if we know the Jets have had trouble with Dallas this year, everyone wants Vegas out. No one wants <laughs> Vegas to win. They are the, I think they're the number one hated team yeah. in the league now, right? They're the heels. They are definitely the heels. They're the bloodline of the uh, of the <laughs> National Hockey League. Uh, National Hockey League right now. Um, and, you know, and I had a conversation with a certain employee of the Vegas Golden Knights over the course <laughs> oh. of the weekend, giving him the business. And I said, listen, everyone is going to say what they're saying right now, and justifiably so. Like, it's one thing if guys are legitimately hurt. And when you say in late February, a guy is out with a lacerated spleen, which has a three to six month recovery, I mean, we'll take you on your word. But if all of a sudden... The guy turns out to be Superman and is back in seven weeks in time for game one of the playoffs. Don't be surprised when people's smell test comes up a little off. So I don't know whether Mark Stone is Superman and he just recovers way faster than any other normal human being would. Or whether the actual injury wasn't what it was put forth. I mean, the NHL allegedly goes, oh, here's Gary, Mark Stone, Golden Knights captain. I'm going to play tonight. I'm sure the I'm sure the responses to that tweet are uh, are, are are quite interesting. But like how do you not raise your eyes at what they've done in this particular case with Mark Stone? I mean, three years in a row is incredible. But and I mean I get it. The guy had back surgery last year. I mean maybe you want to give him a bit of a break, but to do it in this fashion and allegedly doctors every week are checking in on these LTIR guys to see how they're doing. I mean, these miraculous recoveries in between game 82 and game number one makes a lot of people call bullshit. I mean, I guess that's the, the way it is, but nothing's changing for a couple hours or for a couple years, the way the CBA is right now. So the only way to handle it is to beat them. And Dallas has that first opportunity tonight. Yeah, here's Emily Kaplan from ESPN tweeting out, expectation around the NHL's Mark Stone plays tonight yet again. Activated off LTIR just in time for playoffs. Talked to several players and front office executives about it. While jokes fly about cap circumvention, everyone agrees nothing will or can change until the next CBA. And it's kind of funny you're seeing in Edmonton, like Evander Kane's talking about playing through a sports hernia. And I see all these older fans tweeting, Ken Holland, he's such a bad GM. Should have put him on LTIR in February and used that cap space to get someone better than Adam Henrique. Uh, so, <laughs> I mean, credit to the Vegas. They're certainly taking advantage of, I don't know, can we call it a loophole or the rules as they're currently constructed? And, you know, aside from that, I thought they did a great job in building their team, making trades and finding players. But part of it is, yeah, I mean, you couldn't Quint add those players if you didn't have that situation to begin with that now sees Mark Stone coming back. I heard Elliot and Merrick today talking about this. And listen, Kelly McCrimmon's a proud guy. I've got a lot of love for Kelly. He's been great to me over the years uh, and us on this program. Um, but they don't like to be thought of as cheaters. Um, but let's face it, a large percentage of the fans of the NHL feel that they have been operating that way and I wouldn't be surprised that many of their counterparts around the league feel the same way uh, but again it's up to the Dallas Stars first up to uh, end the reign of the Golden Knights game number one goes tonight by the way Reem did you know that NHL home uh, home teams were perfect on the weekend and NBA were 14 and 0 the record of home ice or home court teams in the playoffs over the course of the weekend yeah, you know how I know because I watched this video of Pat McAfee just gushing over the Jets, and uh, he did mention it in that. So, uh, yes, uh, it's so you have a chance to extend it to go sixteen and zero if Dallas and Edmonton win tonight. And judging by the chat, everyone wants to see Dallas win. Seventy-five uh, percent of voters want to see them win <laughs> over Vegas. 
well, then people might like our lock shop partner parlay today because we decided to stay away from the Boston Leafs game, but we took the three other home teams, Carolina to win, Dallas to win, Edmonton to win. Uh, when we put that in, it was plus 288. Patty and the fellas gave us a nice boost up to plus 325. So if you like that, Carolina, Dallas, Edmonton tonight, you can get that boosted to plus 325 in the exclusives at CoolBet. And there are actually some other neat exclusives, and a bunch of them uh, clicked last night. What do we got? Playoff performers. Marshand, Aho, and Dreisaitl, all to record a point. That's plus 275. Uh, McDavid, two plus points. Evan Bouchard, one assist, and Oilers to win in regulation, plus 385. Uh, the Dogs, Leafs and Golden Knights, both to win, plus 425. Points from the point, McAvoy, Heiskin, and Bouchard, all to record a point, plus 550. Home team heater. So it's basically our bet that we had before, as well as the Boston Bruins. So Bruins, Canes, Stars, Oilers, all to win, Boosted to plus 650. And the Lamplighter tonight, Matthews, Pasta, and McDavid all to score plus 825. Those are the Canada specials and the Cool Bet exclusives. And as we mentioned, the uh, Lock Shop Partner Parlay is up. Oh, the EST guys have one as well. What's this one today? McDavid, two points. Dry Seidel to score. Nuge, a point. Oilers to win plus 5. 50 NBA playoffs tonight in case you are interested in uh, the Cavs. Minus 217 at home against the Magic. Knicks minus 213 home against the Sixers. And the Nuggets minus 294 home favorites against the Lakers. I'm really pulling for Denver Nuggets, Reem, because I'm hoping that they can enjoy their basketball team go far because I'm hoping that the playoff round for the Denver hockey team is brief. At the hands of the Winnipeg Jets, don't they? Don't they still have uh, Jamal Murray too? Defending, they're the defending oh, yeah. champions, aren't they? Denver. So, uh, yeah, we'll see how it goes. And you know, LeBron still chugging along there with the Lakers. You know, one thing we didn't you touch on it with Jason. I know you were texting me on Saturday, but how much did you enjoy the Maple Leafs getting uh, blown out by Boston on Saturday? And you know, a lot of Leafs fans going to be upset, but I agree with Jason. They're not built to win the cup. Like who's Who's their goalie? Samsonov, like, you're not going to win uh, with him. I know, you know, it's kind of funny. You've seen some, I don't want to call them no-name goalies, but not considered upper upper echelon goalies win the last couple of years, like Dar- Darcy Kemper, uh, who lost a starting job to Lindgren this year, and uh, Aiden Hill. But I just don't think Leafs uh, have the defense and uh, the goaltending to get it done here in the playoffs. Well, I mean, maybe have one of their $11 million players show up. Like, did Mitch Marner even play on Saturday? I mean, a total non-factor in that game. Uh, Matthews had some good chances. And the mm-hmm. Leafs, and as I say, the Leafs had uh, some really good expected goals numbers. Uh, well, Jeremy Swayman seemingly owns them right now. So uh, I, I'll be honest. I thought the Leafs were going to win game one. I, I had a feeling that the Leafs were going to go in and sort of you know, steal one right off the bat. That did not happen. And I didn't think they played terribly, but as Merrick said earlier on, you just as things kept going, it just became a regular old Boston-Toronto game. Um, so anyways, that's the early one tonight. Canes Islanders going at it, and then later on tonight, the puck drops on the remaining two series, Edmonton and the LA Kings at 9, 8.30, Central Division primetime, Dallas and the Vegas Golden Knights. And uh, back at it tomorrow, Remo, with plenty from downtown. Jets, Avs, as we get ready for a late one at 8.30. And the Jets looking to go up 2-0 on the way to Denver. Yeah, what, what are they going to do for an encore, Hus? Because that was that's going to be a tough one to follow up. 7-6, uh, the crowd was buzzing. Uh, that flyover, I can say, I was at the uh, atrium there. At Canada Life during the flyover, and you could hear it. It was uh, it was very loud. So that was that was pretty cool. Like, how is the street party going to be at eight thirty? We did have some incredible weather yesterday. A lot of questions. Uh, not a lot of lineup questions for the Jets. Maybe a couple for the Avalanche. So game two, and you know, I was having flashbacks to game one last year. The Jets came out so hot. You thought they were going to take Vegas. So let's. Let's pump the brakes a little uh, on people in our chat. Uh, I saw a couple broom 
emojis. Whoa, 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 yeah, whoa, whoa. whoa. <laughs> yeah, whoa. So uh, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, so I'm looking forward to game two and, um, you know, just being in the building again. Um, well, you know, incredible. I'm still buzzing, man. That was uh, that was something else. Like, we've seen a lot of playoff games here the last couple of years. I mean, a 7-6 game in the playoffs. That's I know it's game one and, like, well, the first round, so it's not, like, the most intense. Like, everyone talks about Nashville game three. I mean, we hadn't had a lot of home playoff wins as well. Like, was that the last home playoff win? No, no, game one against Vegas was. Yeah. But, um, yeah. So we'll Which see is how nuts. I totally forgot about that, and I'm glad I we didn't bring it up or talk about it because I, well, that probably would have been in my head. Uh, I, I felt a weird sense of confidence last night, and I think mm-hmm. maybe it was Josh Morrissey scoring that early goal to get them right back in. And then obviously the lead they had in the third period. But despite as how crazy that game was and the fight that the Avalanche showed when they got down, still just sort of had that feeling that when it all comes down to it in the third period, Connor Hellebuck's going to make the save that he needs to and the Winnipeg Jets were going to get it done. And they did 7-6 last night. I'll say this. Um, you know, I noticed that that was the first home win in a while. One thing we've never seen in the Jets 2.0 era a home overtime win. Uh, they had a couple losses with fans. <laughs> we yeah, with fa- sorry, with fans, with fans. I got to say with fans because uh, that series with Edmonton, uh, Montreal, those didn't happen. But but um, yeah. as far as people remember, but yeah, with so fans, the Edmonton had- one did. Edmonton one did. Edmonton we swept happened. them. Yeah, but a no one saw it. Yeah. the Oilers. But uh, they lost in overtime to Anaheim. They lost in overtime last year to Vegas. So I've never seen in person. Uh, actually, uh, sorry, I've never seen a Jets home overtime win. So I don't know. If you go to overtime, that's something to think of. I don't know if I just jinx them or not. But, hey, first uh, home wins in 2018 in front of fans. So that was pretty cool yesterday. No doubt about it. Well, listen, gang, great to have everybody with us. A big shout-out again to the folks at uh, Rollies Transfer. Great to have the Rollies guys on board with us. And a big thanks to all the sponsors that make this show happen each and every day. Um, get some rest tonight, gang. Get to bed early. Maybe pencil in a late afternoon nap tomorrow because much like the Winnipeg Jets, uh, they're going to need you to be at your best filling that building tomorrow night. The street parties as well in downtown Winnipeg for the 8.30 start in game number two. That is going to do it for us. Thanks to Hammer and Jason Demers for jumping on. Great stuff with Michael Remus getting all that audio from the Winnipeg Jets. And great to see so many fired up Jet fans with us today in the WST chat. Make sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. And join us tomorrow for a game day edition before game two of WST. Have a great one, everyone. We'll see you tomorrow. Oh, my God. Shut it down. Let's go home. Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk.